All right, good morning. Thank you again to everybody for, for coming out, uh, tuning in uh, today. We really appreciate all the time that you give us throughout the year um, and give to other golf associations throughout the year, everything you do for amateur golf. Um, unfortunately, yet again, we are not able to do this in person, really looking forward to when we can get back to, to do that. Um, but uh, we're excited for today and tomorrow, the slides and, and everything we have ready to present to you. Uh, hope you learn a lot. We will get started with uh, some quick rules and a little introductions before I hand it over and, and we uh, really start digging into the rules. So for the, um, some, some local rules for the day. Uh, so everyone's gonna be muted. Please uh, try and stay on mute as much as you can, um, except for we'll, we'll have periodic question slides where you can speak up um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, you can also put your questions into the chat um, if you'd rather do it that way, and we will bring them up at the next question slide. Um, please re uh, refrain from answering the questions in the chat or discussing questions that go into the chat. We want to keep all the focus on what's being presented, um, but have either one of those options um, to raise questions that come up. And then also wanted to touch on the rules officials gift real quick. Um, we, so we gave you those three options um, this year with um, some cool stuff that hope, uh, hope is new for you. Hope that's something that, um, some things that you'll like. Um, the, the survey format is obviously not, uh, not very dynamic, like I said. Um, so don't worry about if you are unclear about what you can pick. Um, if that's the case, reach out to me. If I'm not sure what you're asking for, I will reach out to you. Um, don't worry, we will get We'll get you what you want to get uh, before we place those orders. Um, once we get everything settled, we'll order them from the vendors. Uh, we'll get them out to you as fast as we can. Uh, we're going to do more, a little more mailing this year. Uh, we will do hand delivering as much as we can for everyone in the, in the Pinehurst area um, or bring them to your event when you get started um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, so again, it's going to be a little bit of a process. Uh, hopefully, like I said, back to just handing you a gift uh, soon, but uh, we'll make it work again this year and appreciate um, all your help and patience with that. Uh, I wanted to touch on the Facebook group real quick. Um, so we got this going again. We had a chat about Charlie Hoffman and his situation at um, the waste management this weekend. Um, pretty much whenever anything comes up, uh, often on the tour or USGA event, um, try and put it in that, in that Facebook group, get some discussion going, um, learn what you can from it. And also it, it always, uh, for me personally, those, those video things that, that you can pull back on um, always help me learn the rules the best. Um, so that's a, it's a good discussion and uh, get people's opinion, get people's thoughts on what they actually see on the golf course. Uh, we're also going to put a lot more information in terms of uh, the events that we need help at. Uh, I'm going to post that in the Facebook group, try and keep that um, content a little more, a little more frequent and more fresh and, and have that be a place that you can go to get more information uh, about the CGA there. So quickly introductions for the tournament staff. Uh, so we have, you'll hear from Rusty Harder uh, very soon, our director of rules and competitions. Uh, Maggie Watts, our director of women's golf. She's actually at a ladies four ball play day um, today and tomorrow. So she will not be able to join us, but um, send it, she said to send her regards to everybody. Uh, we have the junior team now, uh, Christopher Zay, our director of junior golf, Brandon Hood, the assistant director of junior golf, and Killian Casson, our junior golf tournament manager. And then we have myself, Chris Wolf, senior tournament manager, uh, Hogan May, who joined us in December as a tournament manager, and Tom Roth as a tournament manager. So I will hand it over to Rusty, and he will get us started on rule number eight. All right, thanks, Wolf. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, welcome to the 2022, everyone. Sorry that I uh, can't do this in person, but hopefully this will be a, a good experience. And um, for everyone that I know, thank you again for all of your help uh, over, over the last year and several years, your dedication and time and uh, effort to, to learn the rules and help us out. Um, it really means a lot to us. And, and we couldn't do all of the uh, 370 events that we calculated uh, for 2021 without you all. So um, thank you. And for everyone new, I look forward to hopefully running across you at a tournament real soon and, uh, and enjoy working with, uh, with all of you. So we'll jump into 
Rule eight first, um, we want to cover this one. This is kind of the basic uh, premise of the game of golf that you, uh, you know, that you play the course as you find it and play the balls that lies. So that's kind of the, 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 the real rule number one of the rules of golf. Um, and uh, I've been doing some kind of virtual studying um, and they mention, you know, what rules should you start learning the rules at? And they say, even if you start at rule one, you're in the middle of the rules right off the bat. So there's really no great spot to automatically go and start. Um, uh, start with the rules of golf. So we wanted to just start right here at rule eight and, uh, and cover that because that's really the, uh, the basis of playing the game of golf. So quick overview of rule eight here. Um, uh, the first section is obviously the largest section and what we'll cover in depth are actions to improve the conditions affecting the stroke. Um, that's 8.1. 8.2 covers deliberate actions to alter other physical conditions that aren't covered under conditions affecting the stroke. And 8.3 covers deliberate actions to alter physical conditions affecting another player. So those are the three um, kind of big sections here of rule eight um, that we'll cover. So I mentioned this already that, uh, that this is the principle behind the rules of golf, the main principle that play the course as you find it. And uh, this quote from uh, Richard Tufts here that, that really guides everything that we do is, you know, one of the great features of the game of golf is that it tests the player's ability to execute a great assortment of strokes under a perplexing variety of conditions. So it's a number of, uh, of uh, you know, types of shots that you'll have to hit and conditions that you will encounter on the golf course as you, uh, as you go around and, and all the players will encounter those as well. So we'll jump right into rule eight one, the first section here, um, an overview of kind of how the rule is gonna be laid out in the rule book um, is that uh, the first section here will be areas that must not be improved. So the rule is gonna tell us that, uh, you know, what you cannot improve and how you are not allowed to improve them in, in section two. And then obviously there are gonna be exceptions. So we're gonna tell you that you can't improve things this way, but there are some limited times where you're gonna be allowed to improve uh, some of these conditions affecting the stroke. So we'll start obviously first off with, uh, with the areas that must not be improved. I'm sorry, uh, section four and five will also cover the ability to restore improved conditions. Uh, this is a new concept that was put in in 2019 where you're not going to be automatically penalized if you improve a condition affecting the stroke. There may be an opportunity to go back and, uh, and basically eliminate the uh, penalty by uh, restoring the improved condition and, and, and making it back the way it was. And then the uh, ability to restore a worsened condition. So your ball's at rest and somehow the condition has been worsened um, in some way. Are we going to be allowed to fix that and get it back to the way it was when our ball came to rest? So we'll cover all of that here. Um, a definition now that used to be in the, um, sorry, I'm referencing the old rules, but a, a definition that we need to learn and know exactly what it means because uh, it's going to mean specifically um, if there could be a penalty involved or not here in this situation. So what does improve mean? It means to alter one or more of the conditions affecting the stroke. And that's also going to be a defined term that we're going to tell you what conditions affecting the stroke cover. So again, to improve means to alter one of, or more of the conditions affecting the stroke or other physical condition, conditions affecting a play so that the player gains a potential advantage for the stroke. So the key here is potential advantage. It doesn't mean that it's an automatic advantage. It just means that there's potential there that the player gains an advantage. So just because the player may, may tell us that, well, I'm not gaining an advantage by replacing this divot. Well, there's potential advantage in, in improving those conditions affecting the stroke in that case. So couple key words in there that we need to uh, keep in mind. Now, another term that we need to define, um, it's kind of an umbrella term to cover the live player's ball at rest, area of intended swing, and your stance, kind of these three big areas that, uh, that we need to watch out for in rule eight. So the conditions affecting the stroke is an umbrella term to cover the lie of the player's ball at rest, the area of their intended swing, the area of their intended stance, their line of play and the relief area if they were to drop or place the ball. So it covers all of these things where previously we had to say all of these things um, when we're talking about improving areas. Now we just say, if you're improving the conditions affecting your stroke, that's what's gonna be important now. So we're trying to just take words out of it. So the big key here, and, and you'll see this written a lot as C-A-T-S, uh, maybe when you're reading stuff um, online or reading stuff, conditions affecting the stroke, um, it's important to know what all that covers. <laughs> Okay, further to define what is the lie, 
the player's ball at rest. So the definition of lie, it's, it's simply the spot where the ball is at rest. And it also includes any growing or natural object. So the grass may be perhaps under it, an immovable obstruction that may be uh, touching it, an integral object or a boundary object. That would also be considered part of the lie of the ball, player's ball at rest. Loose impediments and movable obstructions are not part of the lie of the ball. Here, they're covered under their own specific definitions and uh, specific rules there and what you can do with those. What is the area of intended stance? Well, it's gonna include both where the player will place his or her feet and the area that might reasonably affect how and where the body is positioned. So it's your feet on the ground and where you're gonna take your stance and put your feet on the ground. But it's also, if you're next to a tree or a bunch of limbs or a bush, it also includes that airspace where you know, you're know you gonna place your body. So um, that's your part of your intended stance as well. Obviously, if we're in the middle of the fairway, we're really only talking about where we're gonna place our feet. Um, there's no real issue with the airspace in our body because we're not next to any, any objects in that case. But it's the uh, area of intended slants, where you place your feet, the uh, <clears throat> area around your body in preparing for and making the intended stroke. So a key here is also in preparing for and making the intended stroke. So it's, it's stepping in and taking your stance, um, that entire process there. Our area of the intended swing, that's gonna include the entire area that might reasonably affect, um, you probably guessed it here, any part of our back swing any part of our downswing and the completion of the swing. So that entire arc that we make, um, you know, for a driver, for a, a full swing, you know, it's going to be all the way up, you know, kind of around our head, all the way back down and around our head. If it's just a chip shot, it may be, you know, just up to our waist and down and back through to our waist. So um, the area of intended swing is not the same for every stroke or every player. Um, it's unique to every player, but it's the area for their intended stroke that they are trying to make here. And the line of play, that's where the player intends for his or her ball to go after the stroke. Um, none of us, even the great Tiger Woods, not every shot that he makes goes where he intends it to go. But everyone has a line of play according to the rules of golf, and it's where the player intends for their ball to go. It may not end up going there, so they're not going to be penalized if it goes somewhere other than their intended line of play. But here, the line of play includes where the player intends for their ball to go, the area on that line that's a reasonable distance up above the ground and on either side of that line. So the concept here is, you know, if you're hitting a shot five yards, your line of play um, is not very big and it's not going to be very wide because there's not much variance there. But if you're hitting a 200 yard shot, that line of play is going to end up getting pretty wide once you get, um, you know, further away from, uh, from where you made the stroke from. So um, it's, you know, an area that varies depending on the type of stroke and, uh, and where it is. But it also includes area above the ground, and it's not just a one straight line. There's some wiggle room on each side of that line. And again, it's not necessarily a straight line between two points because we're not necessarily, maybe we're trying to hit a shot that curves around a tree or something like that. Um, so it's not always a straight line from your ball to the hole. You know, you may have to play out to the right um, just the way it goes. So you're not even going at the flag stick. Your line of play is you know, to the right of these trees just so I can get it back out into the fairway. So we're not even going at the hole at that point. We're just trying to get it back in play. So key there, line of play, not a straight line. It's where the player intends for their ball to go, and it does not necessarily need to go straight at the flag stick. Uh, the relief area where the player would drop or place the ball. So if they've got their ball in their hand and we need to get it back in play, we're going to put it back in play in a specific relief area. Um, it's where the player must drop a ball when taking relief under a rule. Um, and further, if, if you had to place the ball in that relief area, um, it's the area that they must place the ball. So that covers the entire relief area in that case. Um, it's either going to be one or two club links, depending on which rule or uh, which situation you're operating under. So the conditions affecting the stroke, we cannot improve. We know that now. Um, now, what does it mean? What can we not do to improve? So what are we prohibited from doing? We're not going to be allowed to move, bend, or break any, uh, any growing or natural object, any immovable obstruction, any integral object, boundary object, T or T marker. So here, these are also, these are going to be some defined terms in the rules of golf for us here. Um, but uh, growing or natural object obviously would include, include trees, grass, things like that.
Uh, an immovable obstruction would cover things like a drain grate, a cart path, or a, or a uh, sprinkler head. You're not allowed to move or break an integral object, anything that's defined as an integral object by the committee. Um, boundary objects, out of bound stakes, white out of bound stakes, or, or maybe a fence if it's defined as a boundary object, and T markers uh, when you're playing that hole. So we're not allowed to move, bend, or break any of those. We're not going to be allowed to alter the surface of the ground by replacing divots, removing or pressing down replaced divots, or creating or eliminating holes, indentions, or uneven surfaces. So that, again, the key is play the course as it lies. So you're not guaranteed a great lie in the middle of the fairway, and you're not guaranteed a terrible lie in the rough. You're going to kind of get whatever your stroke uh, uh, gives you there in that case, and we've got to play the ball as it lies. We can't replace those divots. Um, if it affects the conditions affecting our stroke and we can't create or eliminate holes or uneven surfaces because we don't like them in that case. We're also not gonna be allowed to remove or press down sand or loose soil. There is a special caveat in the putting green rules that you are allowed to remove or press, uh, remove sand or loose soil on the putting green only. Um, so this video uh, doesn't work here, but uh, I believe this was Rory McElroy. Out of a bunker, we see this a lot. Bunker shots splash sand up onto the fringe and onto the putting green. So here, I don't know if you can see my uh, laser pointer here, but so the line here, the edge of the putting green, this sand on the putting green can be removed, no penalty, but under rule 8.1, it tells us that we cannot remove sand or loose soil elsewhere. So on the fringe and part of the general area here, we're not gonna be allowed to remove sand or loose soil. And we're not allowed to remove dew, frost, or water from the surface of the ground. And we're also not going to be allowed to build a stance by moving Panicle. loose impediments or movable obstructions into place. Or altering the surface of the ground to build our stance. Now, those are the things we are not allowed to improve or uh, ways to improve. Now, what are the exceptions? <clears throat> when are we going to be allowed to improve these areas without penalty? If we're fairly searching for the ball, where is my sound? And what does that mean here? So, what does fairly searching mean? It means reasonable actions to find and identify your ball by moving sand and water, moving or bending grass, bushes, branches, or even breaking when reasonable. So, if we're trying to find our golf ball, we're allowed to move this grass, bend or break, <clears throat> bend bushes, bend branches. And if, if something breaks in this case and it was reasonable for that to break, we're not gonna be penalized in that case. So if we're fairly searching for our ball, we've only got three minutes, let's try to, uh, to, uh, to find that golf ball. Yeah, it's just right here, but it's not doing anything. Also, reasonable actions uh, to remove loose impediments and movable obstructions. So we're allowed to remove loose impediments and movable obstructions. That's, that's uh, not going to be penalized unless we accidentally cause our ball to move. And that's going to fall under our, another rule, rule nine, um, to see if there's a penalty involved. We're allowed to mark the spot of the ball, lift and replace the ball in certain, in certain situations. And we're allowed to ground the club lightly uh, before taking, before making a stroke. We're allowed to fairly take our stance. So here in this case, we're again, this is uh, covering that kind of vertical airspace in taking a stance here. We're allowed to back into these trees um, and, and try to fairly take a stance. We're not gonna be able to take our club and push them all down behind us. We back in basically the, the least intrusive way possible to, uh, to take a stance. And that also means that we're not going to be entitled to a normal stance. So we're not always going to be able to stand with our feet shoulder width apart with a slight bend in our knees. We may have to do whatever is reasonable for us to take that stance to make the stroke. And we must use the least intrusive course of action here. So sometimes we're not, if we're right-handed, we may not be able to make the stroke right-handed. We may only be able to make that stroke uh, left-handed down on our knees like this to just advance the ball. And again, in making a stroke, you're not going to be penalized if you alter any of these conditions because you're making the stroke and completing the stroke here. So if uh, he takes this stroke and takes that entire bush out, no penalty here because it's allowed under, under this section. 
And again, teeing area permissions, I think I see this in the chat. Um, the teeing area is a special area of the course where we're gonna have some more uh, allowances. We're allowed to alter the surface of the ground and uh, to kind of make a tee for us to make the stroke when the ball is in the teeing area. So we can mound up uh, sand like this. You can take another club and punch a little divot out and, uh, and make a stroke just like that. That's only allowed on the teeing area. Elsewhere on the course, um, that is gonna be prohibited. And again, you can use a tee, move or bend growing and natural objects, alter the surface of the ground, as I just said. And you can also remove dew, frost, and water in the teeing area only, special just to the teeing area. Putting green is going to have, again, some specific permissions and allowances. This We talked about removing sand or loose soil. It's only allowed on the putting green and in the teeing area in those special cases. You can repair damage that you cannot repair otherwise. We know that. And in the bunker, you're going to have special permissions, and you're allowed to actually rake and, uh, you know, re-alter the surface of the ground after a stroke there. So there's some special allowances in the bunker as well. And you're entitled to move natural objects to see if it's loose. So you may not be sure, is this a, a, a root in the ground or is it just a twig on the ground? You can move it to see if it's loose or not. If it's not loose, let's put it right back. If it is loose, then you're able to... Uh, to remove it, no object. So you have a little bit of opportunity to try to determine if something is loose or not. Okay, now we wanna talk about um, the ability to restore these improved conditions. So maybe a player has um, done something to uh, improve their conditions affecting the stroke. Can we get them out of a penalty by restoring that back to the way it was originally? So this is, was a new concept in 2019 here. <clears throat> So it's limited to improvements only covered under the first section of rule 81A. So basically in general, things on the ground, you cannot restore. So if you replace a divot or if you, you know, remove sand or something like that, you're not gonna be able to restore that back the way it exactly was. This restoration is only limited to when you move or bend or break something growing attached um, in that case. So here's kind of an overview of what may be restored. If you move, bend or break things growing or attached, um, you have the opportunity to try to restore it if you move or bend or break any uh, immovable obstruction or boundary object, moving a loose impediment into position or moving a movable obstruction. So we can try to restore that um, to avoid penalty. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to avoid penalty, but we have an opportunity to um, try to eliminate it. And again, option, uh, things that may not be restored, altering the surface of the ground, removing that sand or loose soil. We can't ever get it back to exactly the way it was and removing dew, frost, or water. Um, once it's gone, it's gone. So once you do those, um, there's no way to get back out of any penalty that is associated with that. So how are we gonna restore uh, when moving or bending an object? So we replace, uh, how to restore when moving or bending an object. So the example, replacing a boundary object that's been removed. So we go up to a white stake and it's in my backswing and I pull that white stake out. Um, under rule 8.1, that's gonna be a penalty. But here I can replace that boundary object that's been removed. If I put it exactly back the way it was, um, I can avoid penalty here. Or if I return a tree branch or grass back to its original position. So in fairly taking the stance, if I go in and take my hand and pull that branch in front of, uh, I think this is Frederick Jakobson perhaps, but if I pull that branch in front of him, behind him, he's gonna have the opportunity to then move that branch back the way it really was. Uh, originally was and fairly take its stance. So there's some limitations on what we can uh, and can't do here. Um, improvements must be eliminated and we must use the original object. So we can't take another white boundary stake um, and put it in that hole. It's gotta be the original. If it's a branch that you break, you gotta use the original branch to try to restore it in that case. The object must be moved back again into its original position. And so it must be recreated exactly the way it was. So if you're not able to, so let's go back the other way. If you're not able to replace the boundary object or return the tree branch back to their original position, well, you've tried to avoid penalty by restoring it, but you did not follow this rule and restore it correctly because you've got to use the original object. The improvement must be eliminated and the object must be moved back to its original position. So if you don't have those three caveats covered, you're still gonna be subject to the penalty in that case. So we're giving you an opportunity to avoid penalty, but you have to follow this strictly um, to avoid it. 
The next concept is the ability to restore a worsened condition. So basically your balls come to rest, the condition of the uh, conditions affecting stroke have been worsened somehow. Are we able to restore it? So this rule says we can restore conditions when they're altered by any person other than the player, by an animal, artificial, or an artificial object. So this example happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, playoff, two balls in the bunker. First one came to rest. Uh, second one came to rest. Player made the stroke, and we can see these conditions have been altered. There's now sand pushed up in front of the player's ball. They were, you saw it on TV, they were allowed to uh, push that sand back and restore the uh, conditions back as closely as possible the way they were. The restoration is not permitted when it's done by the player. So if a player worsens their conditions, they're not going to be able to fix it. So if you somehow worsen your condition, uh, worsen your conditions, then um, you're just going to have to take it. If it's done by a natural object or by natural forces. So if wind or water or something else worsens your conditions, that's just the way that, uh, that golf goes in that case. <clears throat> if the condition cannot be restored, and we are allowed to actually uh, restore the condition, then we can lift and replace the ball in the nearest spot, not near the hole in the most similar condition within one club length in the same area of the course. So that, that's covered, I believe, under Rule 14, how to exactly follow that position, uh, procedure there. <clears throat> now, Rule 8.2. So in addition to Rule 8.1 that we just covered, the player must not deliberately alter other conditions. So we have specific conditions covered in 8.1, and those are the conditions affecting the stroke. Um, in that case, 8.2 covers other conditions out there. So it's where the ball might go after the next stroke. So that's not exactly the line of play. It's just, you know, potentially where the ball might end up after the next stroke, where the, might, where the ball might go if it moves before the next stroke. So it covers just some specific uh, uh, times that are not covered under <laughs> conditions affecting the stroke that are not part of, uh, part of that definition there. And rule eight, three, the player must not deliberately improve or worsen the conditions of affecting the stroke of another player. So here we're telling uh, the player that they can't go and deliberately alter, um, deliberately alter their, you know, fellow, or I'm sorry, their competitors' uh, conditions affecting the stroke here. And you may not alter other physical conditions to affect where another player's ball might go after the stroke if it moves before the next stroke. Uh, there's another special kind of concept here um, that you're allowed to do things to care for the course. So if you're taking actions to just care for the course and it's not going to violate any of your conditions affecting the stroke or another player's conditions affecting the stroke, then you would be permitted to do so. So we're allowed to, again, if we're just caring for the course, rake footprints in the bu bunker that may have been left by someone else um, in a previous group in that case. So again, quickly, just uh, I know we hit rule eight pretty quick here, but uh, rule eight one, that's the biggest kind of meat of this rule here. And that's uh, improving conditions affecting the stroke. Play the course as you find it, play the ball as it lies. That's all covered under rule eight one. Um, and then eight two covers deliberate actions to alter other physical conditions. And eight three, um, deliberate actions to alter another player. Again, we're allowed to take reasonable actions to just care for the course. Um, that would not be a violation under this rule there. Any questions on rule eight? You can put it in the chat or um, if you want to unmute for just a minute here, we can cover anything that I may have uh, glossed over too quickly there. Can you give us an example of um, <clears throat> um, caring for the course where it would not be a penalty uh, give us a situation where that would be, I guess, uh, discussed in terms of the, it, whether it was a deliberate action affecting another player or actually caring for the course. Can you give us an example? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, I mean, you know, it. so let's say that your your ball is in the, I don't want to miss this. I'm trying to find one, but, but in, in general, you know, if, if there are footprints, you know, in a bunker, 
and, and you see them, you know, now in the rules, basically we want to get that bunker, you know, we want to get rid of those footprints in general. So you're going to be allowed to do that as long as you're not in any violation of, of the conditions affecting the stroke or where your ball is in that case. But I'm trying to find a, a good example of that um, here for you. Or even, okay, so, you know, your ball is, is 20 yards up ahead, Skip. I believe that's Skip that asked the question. And you're walking to your ball, you know, and there's a bunch of divots. You can fill those divots with sand, you know, if it's 10 yards behind your ball. So basically we're just telling you, you know, take care of the course as best you can, as long as you're not in that special conditions affecting the stroke um, is basically what it's doing. So fill all those divots, you know, 10 yards behind your ball in that case, because that's not um, covered under any of this that you're going to be have an issue with there. Um, and kind of the same there with, with raking the bunker <clears throat> there. So it's not a great example, but if I see someone filling divots out there and their ball's still in the fairway, um, I'm not going to run over there and say, you know, are you, you know, are you improving the conditions affecting your stroke? If it's nowhere close to where their ball was, they're just caring for the course and that's going to be um, okay. And there may be a better example someone may have than what I came up with there, but that was just kind of on the fly thinking of that. Well, to continue with, this is Bill Hagel, sorry. To sorry. continue with that um, example, let's say, uh, and again, this is affecting another player. Uh, you're filling sand divots, I don't know, maybe near the green. The guy's 100 yards out, still still to hit. And now his ball lands short of the green in a sand divot. Is You know, that, it seems like you're... Um, caring for the course, but it did affect the next stroke of, of a different player. I, yeah, I'm having a, a, so, a hard time uh, understanding where you draw the line there. Yeah, so it's a, it was a, it's a, a tricky new concept, but so you're saying that, um, so like I, I make my stroke and I fill the divot and then you play a stroke and it comes to rest in that divot, right? Is that what yeah, you're that's a good example. Let's, let's call it that way let's make that the example um so you know in that case so rule eight three talks about and eight two talks about deliberate actions to alter the physical conditions affecting another player um there so you know filling a sand field divot you know while we're playing the hole that's caring for the course and it's not reasonable for me you know if you're 100 yards away from me or you know even if you're on the other side of the green that oh there's a chance his ball is going to come to rest in this sand field divot you know that's not you know, that's not what in this case is. Now, maybe if we're, you know, there's a collection area and we're both down in that collection area, I can still, I can chip up to the green and my ball comes to rest up there. I can fill a divot, even though, you know, well, if he lives this chip short, it's going to roll right back into this collection area. That's caring for the course. And even though there is a chance it could come to rest in this divot that I'm just about to repair because of this collection area, we're saying that that's, that's no penalty in this case because you're not deliberately doing it to try to affect the other player. You're just caring for the course now in that, in that particular moment in time. I don't know if that, that kind of answers it there. Also, you know, another, and, and Wolf mentioned this to me, you're, you're in a bunker. So let's say you're, you know, in the back half of the bunker and you make a stroke in the bunker, you leave your ball in the bunker. Um, you can rake that area you know, where you just made the stroke from and then go up and, and play there. So you're just caring for the course um, in that regard, you know, so it's it's no issue there. This is Tim Murphy. There's a uh, decision uh, 8.1a slash 2 that gives some really good examples of where taking action might be considered in violation of the rule that it does not. Perfect. Russ, the use has been Maffet. Um, another thing to consider, the, um, you can have a situation where your ball and your fellow competitor's ball are almost side by side in the fairway. Your ball is closer to the hole, so you're not away, but the other player says, why don't you go ahead and play so you're not standing, you know, I'm not standing on your ball or your lie or anything like that. So you take a divot. And now that divot's right in front of the other player's uh, ball. That player is entitled to the lie, the stance, and the conditions affecting the stroke when their ball came to rest. So you can repair that divot in that particular situation. 
So that would be improving the conditions affecting their stroke, but you're doing it in order to restore the conditions that existed when their ball came to rest. So that's where that's a one where you kind of get caught in between some of the concepts here, but that does, it is a basic fundamental concept throughout the rules. Yeah. Th thanks Ben. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Murphy as well, um, you know, for, for clearing that up, but yeah, there is, and this is in the, uh, interpretations, good examples, specific examples, one that Ben mentioned here, um, of, of actions that are likely to create a potential advantage and actions that are unlikely to create those advantages there. Um, so that's a good way to, to, exa uh, to cover those examples specifically. <clears throat> Any other questions there? All right, if not, we'll jump over. I believe Chris Zay is next. So I will stop sharing my screen for just a moment and then he'll jump on and cover the next segment here. Uh, thanks everyone for that that feedback there. All right, good morning everybody. Hopefully Rusty didn't put you to sleep. No, I'm kidding. That's a, that's a great role there. I'm going to cover first off before I start covering everything. I want to tell you all thank you for what you do. Uh, I know you all love the rules like we do, and it's exciting to um, to get out there on the golf course and help the players out. I think the next rule that I'm going to cover 14 is one that I want you as I go through to kind of walk through it in your head because um, you know there used to be seven reasons that somebody'd redrop and all these different things and and you have to know them on the fly you, you got to be able to help a player get their ball back in play the correct way and so I think rule 14 is very important and I think you all are very important to what we do so again thank you for that everything and for being here and we'll get started there's a couple of videos in here but mostly it's going to be me talking over the rules but like I said I think you should um, really try to see yourself on the course as we go through these rules. Um, did I mess it up? You see, are you guys seeing the screen there? Well, good. Okay. All right. So, rule fourteen: procedures for. Procedures for the ball, marking, lifting, cleaning, replacing on spot, dropping in relief area, playing from wrong place. And then you got 14-1, marking, lifting, and cleaning ball. 14-2, replacing ball on spot, which is more common now. 14-3, dropping the ball in the relief area. And then 14-4, when player's ball is back in play after the original ball is out of play. 145 correcting mistakes made in substituting, replacing, dropping, replacing ball, 14.6, making stroke from where the previous stroke was made, and then 14.7, playing from a wrong place, which is very common. All right, so marking, lifting, and cleaning the ball, introduction. When marking is required, who may lift the ball? Cleaning, lifted ball. So the introduction, rule 14.1 applies deliberate to the deliberate lifting of a player's ball at rest, which includes picking up the ball by hand, rotating it, or otherwise deliberately causing it to move from its spot. So deliberately is a key word, deliberate there. When marking is required and how it must be marked. So when a ball must be replaced, the spot must be marked. So replaced is the key word. There, when it must be replaced, then we must mark that spot. And ball marker or club maybe must be placed right behind the ball, right next to the ball, and the ball marker must be removed before a stroke. That's important. I know there were some companies out there trying to make ball markers where you could align them, but uh, they must be removed before making a stroke. So I like to use the toe of my putter save time, put it right there behind the ball, pick my ball up, clean it, and then move on. But failure to mark location or remove ball marker is a one-stroke penalty. We saw that in the Masters tournament a couple of years ago. John Rahm walked up, picked his ball up off the green. That's a penalty. He did not mark it. 
And a ball marker now, by definition, is an artificial object. So a coin, a T, or an object made to be a ball marker, or other small piece of equipment. And this is an important one. They'll get you on the rules test. It can no longer be a leaf, twig, or other natural object. Some of you uh, that have been in the rules for years know that we used to be able, but those of you that did not, they'll, they'll try to trick us old folks on this one. So you can no longer use a leaf, twig, or other natural object. When do you lift your ball and replace it in the same location? On the putting green, that's common. We all know that. But then the other ones are to see if it's damaged, when play is suspended, to identify it, to make sure it's mine if it's in heavy rough, to restore worsened condition, when it interferes with somebody's play, and to see if the, a rule allows you relief. So if you're trying to see if you know, your ball might be on a sprinkler head or something, and, and you can't really tell you are allowed to, to mark it to see if you do deserve relief from that situation, or uh, maybe embedded ball. So those are the reasons why you would see somebody lifting their ball. And when they do, they need to mark it um, there in those, in those uh, specific instances. And who may lift the ball, the player, or anyone authorized by the player? And now the caddy lifting the ball on the green, the caddy can lift the ball. So the caddy can come over. I don't, I personally don't know why they made such a big deal about this. I, I don't see it happen too often. Maybe it does on the tour. I, I typically, you typically see the player go over and, and mark it, but. And then off the green, it, uh, the caddy has to be authorized for its uh, penalty. So, player is still responsible. Rusty, can you guys, whoever's, can you guys make sure people are staying muted, please? Whoever's got admin, go ahead and mute everybody. Player is still responsible for the actions of their caddy. Cleaning the ball, you may always clean the ball when lifted for the putting green. That's common. We know that. They're not going to trick us on that one. I got muted there. The ball may be cleaned except when lifted from off the putting green. So check for damage. Identification. So we're allowed to just clean it partially to see if it's a if it's interfering with another player's play, and check for possible relief. So we're not allowed to clean the ball in those situate in those situations. So these are exceptions, and if we do, it's going to be a one-stroke penalty. So these these four situations are when you cannot clean your ball when it's in your hand. When you were replacing a ball, this is important to note. These are the ones that trick us a little bit. And like I said, when you're on the on the course, these are the ones you got to know in your head. Replace the ball on a spot. Original ball must be used. And who may replace the ball and how it must be replaced. Spot where the ball is replaced. And where to replace the ball when the original lie is altered. What to do if replaced ball does not stay on the original spot. And so some significant changes here, the ball must be replaced by hand. The ball is never dropped when, re when replacing. So replacing means we're putting our hand down there and replacing it. We're not just dropping it and rolling around with our club to get it back into the lie. If the original lie or location is not known, estimate it. If the ball is under grass or other attached items, replace it under them. So if we're fairly searching for our ball, we kick it in high rough, we don't get to place it on top of the high rough. we got to place it back down in that that lie we had. When do you replace your original ball? When it's lifted under rule 14.1? Most cases where it is moved by anyone other than natural forces. When it is moved by natural forces on the putting green after it was marked, lifted and replaced. So some exceptions to that cannot be easily recovered. So if uh, my ball for some reason uh, rolls off the green into the water. If its original ball is cut or cracked, when play is resumed, we're allowed to put a new ball into play. And when played by another player, so Ben Maffitt didn't identify his Titleist one, and neither did I, or I did. I put a, a black dot on it, and Ben goes to the fairway, hits his 
sees the tightest one, hits it up on the green, but didn't see there was a black dot on it. He's now played my ball, and the rules say, hey, Chris, you don't have to run up there to the green and get that ball and bring it back. Or if you incorrectly if you incorrectly substitute, you do get the general penalty. So in those cases there, when you can substitute, if you uh, incorrectly do it in other cases, then you will get the general penalty. Who may replace ball and how it must be replaced? So a player, partner, or the person who lifted it must replace it. So a lot of times that's confusing to people. Uh, you know, if um, Ben hits a bunker shot onto the green and he's raking the bunker and his ball is in my, in my line, I could go over, mark it, hit my putt, and then go ahead and, and I can replace. I could be the person that replaces it. And how you must replace it, you must set it down on the required spot, letting it go. That's something you'll, as you become a more veteran official, you'll see sometimes uh, you don't push it down in the ground. That used to be kind of a rule. You just let it go. We just want them to set it there and let it go. We're not spinning it. They're not pushing down or, or dropping it from a little bit high. They're just going to set it down and let it go. When placing a ball under a rule, it must be placed by setting it down on the required spot and letting go. If the wrong person replaces the ball or replace it in the wrong way, it is a one, it is one penalty stroke. So the spot where the balls are be replaced, the ball must be replaced on its original spot. That's pretty simple to know. If the spot is not known, it should be estimated and the ball is placed at the estimated spot. So if I hit my ball in the middle of the fairway. I'm walking to it, and a dog comes running out and picks it up and runs over and drops it in the rough. I'm not exactly sure. I was 150 yards away, so I'm not exactly sure where that spot was, but I'm going to estimate it and place my ball there. And the spot includes the vertical location relative to the ground, so if the dog grabbed it out of a bush, I don't get to place it on the ground. And if the ball is under or against something fixed, it must be replaced under or against it. Where to replace the ball when the original lie is altered. So there's two cases where this might happen. And uh, case one in the sand, the lie must be recreated as much as possible. So we're just going to recreate the lie as much as possible. And then if the ball is covered by sand, a small part of the ball may be left visible. If the lie is not recreated, the player is played from a wrong place. So that's actually going to be a, a wrong place penalty. There. The other case that uh, we'll replace when the lie is altered, what we'll do is we'll replace the ball by placing it on the nearest spot with a lie most similar to the original lie. So if Rusty's playing hole five and it runs parallel to hole four, and I would make fun of Rusty, but he's won the staff. He won the staff championship, so he I can't really make fun of him. But let's say Rusty hits an errant tee shot into my fairway, and he walks over there and hits my ball, not thinking anything of it. And then I get down there and realize he hit my ball, and Rusty left a huge fat divot because he chunked it. I don't have to play. I don't have to place replace my ball in that divot. I'm going to replace it and the nearest most similar like lie to the original lie. And it's got to be within one club length from the original spot and not near the hole and in the same area of the course. So if I was in the fairway, I'm going to stay in the fairway. If the original lie is not known, we're not dropping, we're estimating the original lie and we're replacing the ball as required in the sand, recreating the lie or elsewhere, as I just described. When we're replacing, when the ball will not stay in the original spot, we'll try a second time. I think this was, I think this might have been Phil, maybe actually at Pinehurst. I, I don't remember. I know he had that issue there at Pinehurst on the 15th hole, maybe. But you try it once and then you try a second time. If it will not stay after two tries, you find the nearest spot it will stay that is no near the hole and is in the same area of the course. Except if it was on the putting green, the nearest place could be on the putting green or in the general area. And I think that's what I'm talking about. I'm sure some of you might remember. I think Phil might have gotten over to the fringe um, and got to stay up the hill. I, I don't know. I'm getting old. I'm forgetting things. But um, that might be the a case where he gets to stay. He might have got 
pretty good situation there. So when replacing, if it doesn't stay after the first time, you try a second time. And then after that, we're going to kind of go inch by inch to find a, a, a place for it to stay. And if it's on the putting green, we might have to go to the general area. Any questions? Okay, if a player marks his ball on the green and tosses it to the caddy, but the ball rolls into the penalty area and it can't be easily recovered, can he replace it without penalty or does the caddy have to retrieve? And I think that goes back, Rick. I think I, um, they kind of did away with, with that. Um, and 14.2, the except 14.2A, the exception now says the original ball cannot be recovered with reasonable effort and in a few seconds. So as long as the player did not deliberately cause the ball to be become unrecoverable. So 14.2A, exception one, that bullet, I think, is where that gets us off the hook. Um, all those, all those old rules of diving in the water. Or, um, he didn't deliberately toss it to his caddy and and miss his caddy on purpose. So um, I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to think of an example. Maybe if uh, for some reason he tosses it in the crowd on the 16th hole at the waste management, I think he would have to go get that ball and and uh, and put it back in play. But um, but now they pretty much get you off the hook for that that accidental uh, tossing to, to the caddy and dropping it, as long as he didn't deliberately cause it to become un unrecoverable. Any other hey, Chris, questions? Can, yeah, Chris, can you, can you, um, uh, can you, you said that you have to replace the ball in the same area of the course. So what you said was, if I'm in the fairway, I have to replace it in the fairway. Uh, would the area of the course, though, be tied to the general area, which would include yes, fairway? Yes, I might have misspoke. I might have misspoke there. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, general area. So it wouldn't be able to place it in a penalty area. I'm sorry. Um, but when you're replacing it, you want the you want a similar lie. So if the if Russie hit my ball from the fairway. I, I deserve to stay, to have the most similar like lie, which would be a fairway lie um, instead of moving it to the rough. So when you're replacing it and the original lie is altered and uh, anywhere except the sand, it, it does say in the same area of the course, which does mean general area, but I, I, I'm, I'm probably get into talking too much, but um. Well, basically what I'm saying is if I, if I had a fairway lie, I deserve uh, the most similar lie, which should be a, a fairway lie. But maybe if the rough became the, the, you know, the most similar lie to what I have, then it could go there. They do just say the area of the course, which, yes, that would be the general area. There's no way I would be able to place it in, replace it into a, a bunker or, or a different area of the course. Any other questions on, oh, sorry, here's the slide I was looking for. So within one club lane of the original spot and you want the most similar. Let me get my, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse now, but here where it says the lie most similar to the original lie. All right, no more questions on replacing the ball. Again, those that's a replacing the ball is a very common rules officials uh, duty. So this is this is what we do. We get people back in play and we have to know when to replace and when to drop. So dropping, I feel like they did simplify it a little bit. You used to have to remember all those different. Did it do this? Did it do that? Did it jump up? Did it go down? Did it roll seven club lengths? So now. They've made it simpler, dropping the ball in the relief area. So you can always substitute under this rule. So anytime we're dropping now, we can substitute. And the ball must be dropped in the right way. These are the things we're going to cover. Ball must stay in the relief area. And it, if, it, if it is deliberately deflected or stopped, we'll talk about that. So original ball or another ball may be used. Player can always substitute a ball under this rule, even for a second drop. So for some reason, they drop it and they want to 
drop a different ball, they're welcome to substitute. And then even after they dropped it two times, it rolls out of, their, out of the relief area, and now they're going to place it. Maybe they, for some reason, have a dropping ball. I don't know, but they can uh, place it. Here's a good video. Here's a funny video that the Southern California Golf Association did. Oops. Um, and uh, it's a little two-minute video. You can get a break from me talking. Let's go, gentlemen. You're just little maggots. I'm training you to be the best. Yes, sir. Keep those knees up. Have sir, yes, sir. Ride. We are going to be A-class golfers. Guys, sure. Let's play golf. Are you slowing down? What are you doing? You can't slow down. Get down and give me 50. Yes, sir. Get strong here. Straight back. Take some pride in what you're doing, you little sissy. 48, 49, and 50. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Now we're really going to test you, see what you're made of. OK, golfer, it's time to take relief from this admiral course condition and go. That's wrong. That's wrong. That is so wrong. That is wrong! Learn to drop! Hang on a second here, guys. Under the rules of golf, there's a right way and a wrong way to drop a golf ball. Dropping in the right way requires the player to drop the golf ball straight down from knee height. This means no throwing, no rolling, no spinning the golf ball. Knee height refers to the height of your knee in a standing position. Handle that much? Yes, sir. There you go. My work here is done. All right, so glad they have a lot of time on their hands out there in Southern California, but they simplified the rule, as you saw in that video, kind of made fun of the old school where you dropped it over your uh, back shoulder, which that's, be that, uh, that's before me, so I can't say anything about that, but I will say when they first changed this, we did see people dropping from shoulder height a little bit, but we no longer really see that anymore, so that... Uh, now it's pretty much everybody. They made fun of it. A couple of the PJ Tour players made fun of it for a while, but it's pretty uh, common now. You just see it. Knee height means the height of the player's knee when standing, as you can see in in the illustration there. And we don't. You we're not that reasonable. Just we're not running out there with rulers, okay? As a uh, yeah, I, Greg, I did. I tried to, as soon as I started reading that, I tried to change that off. So the end, very end of that, the verbiage on there was not correct. So disregard what they had written there. Reasonable judgment standard applies. Um, we're not going out there with a ruler and, and checking somebody's knee height. And we're, uh, we're just making sure that they are in this area here where their knee is. And they can do it if they want to kneel down. They can do it squatting, as uh, Ricky Fowler showed. that. Uh, making fun of it a couple of years ago, but again, from your golf cart, we're just making sure they're knee height. We're just making sure they don't have a brain fart and do something like this and drop it from their shoulder. And here's a uh, Jay Roberts. I'm not sure if we mentioned him yet. Jay, Jay was um, sat in on one of my rules seminars last year. So I'm gonna take credit for it. And he fell in love with the rules, just like all of us do, because we know they help us. Jay was one of our players. He played in a couple of our mid-amateur championships. I believe he played at Davidson. I don't know the rest of the But anyway, Jay has since really, really gotten into the rules, and he's really good at making videos. So you can check him out on YouTube. But here's a good one about what to do if your ball will not come to rest in the relief area. 
In this video, I'm gonna show you exactly what to do if after dropping a ball in the right way, it comes to rest outside of the relief area. All right, so here we are. I'm a little long past this flag, as you can see. My ball came to rest in this sprinkler head, so I do get free relief. I already found my nearest point of complete relief. So this is what my relief area looks like. Now, if I go to drop this ball, as you can see, it comes to rest outside of the relief area. And when that happens, we are required to drop it again in the right way for a second time. Now, here's a fun fact. Whenever you're dropping and taking relief under a rule, you're allowed to use the original ball or another ball. And that applies each time that you drop it, and it even applies to placing. So if I wanted to, I could actually use a different ball for my second drop. And in this case, I'm going to, just for demonstration purposes. So I've got another ball right here, and I'm going to drop it again for the second time. But here's what we need to prepare for. If I drop this ball and it comes to rest outside of the relief area for a second time, the rules require me to place it. And I'm going to place it on the spot where this second drop first strikes the relief area. So when I drop this, I'm going to keep an eye on where this ball first strikes the relief area because that's the spot where I'm going to place it. So I'll drop it again in the right way for a second time. It did come to rest outside of the relief area. I have an eye on where that ball first struck the relief area. That's the spot where I'm going to place it. Now, again, I can use a different ball if I wanted to, to place it on that spot. I'm just gonna use this ball over here. So I've got my eye on where that ball first struck the relief area. And I'm going to move forward with placing this ball. Now, I'm gonna set the ball down on that spot and I'm going to let go. Now, the ball stayed at rest on that spot, which means that we've completed taking relief. This ball is now in play and I can make my next stroke. Okay, that video is exactly what we do as officials. We stand there and help the player drop the ball back in play. And a lot of times as a new official, what you'll catch yourself doing is you're gonna be that person that kind of keeps an eye on that spot. So that player did, did the relief process themselves. But when that second drop rolls outside the relief area, a lot of times that's what we do. We kind of point with our walkie talkies to where the second drop hit the struck at the ground and that's where the player is gonna place it. So as a new official, that's a great video. You can watch that a couple of times. Uh, Jay, he did everything perfectly or he talked about exactly what I just talked about. You can substitute another ball for the second drop or even for the place. So if he wanted to pull a third ball out of his pocket and place it there, he could have done that. So I think that's a great video for Jay. Oh, sorry. That Jay did there again, check his uh, YouTube channel out. He's got some other really good ones. Uh, he, got, he does a really good job with those graphics and, and drawing. So also allowed to move impediments before you drop. Yes, you are allowed to move loose impediments before you drop. I believe that um, we'll talk about that a little later. So when dropping, we know the ball must be dropped in the relief area. So we're not trying to get the ball into the relief area and guessing where it's going to roll. We're going to drop the ball in the relief area, just like this first diagram. It must drop straight down into the relief area. The ball must come to rest in the relief area. So right here, it came to rest in the relief area. And the ball played when redropped required. If it's outside the relief area, the general penalty. And if it's placed rather than dropped in the relief area, general penalty. So if somebody places instead of drops it. If played from the relief area, but after being dropped incorrectly, it's a one stroke. So if the person drops from shoulder height and somehow they got their ball into the relief area, and then played it, it's a one stroke penalty because they did play from the area we wanted them to, they just did it incorrectly. But in this instance, let's say she drops it here, it bounces out, she plays in the second picture there, she plays from outside a relief area. That's a general penalty, 14-7A, we'll cover that here in a second. And then if placed rather than dropped in the relief area, that's a general penalty. The ball dropped in the right way, deliberately stopped or deflected. Anyone deliberately 
the flex or stops in motion after it hits the ground, or the ball in motion hits any equipment other or other object or any other person that a player deliberately positioned or left so that might stop or deflect the ball in motion. The drop does not count. The ball must be dropped again. If deflected or stopped by any player or caddy or anything left in the position by them, the general penalty is applied. So I kind of tell people in my rules seminar, the rules of golf are written that you're going to be an honest person and, and take what the course gives you. You cannot lay a club down across a divot in the area where you're going to have to drop so that your ball will not go into that divot just in case. Okay. So that's what they mean here. You cannot leave a club on top of a divot so that your ball won't end up in that divot. There are some exceptions. If there's a no reasonable chance the ball will come to rest in the relief area, there's no penalty and the drop counts. So in this scenario, if Tiger's former caddy Stevie grabbed the ball there because he knew that it was just going to keep rolling and rolling, that's okay because we knew it was outside the relief area. Or this applies whether or not the ball is in the relief area when it is deflected or stopped. So in addition to the exception, I'm sorry, I kind of read that a little funky. In, in addition to the exception is if we if we stopped it before it even rolled out of the relief area, which you might see that happening. On, if you, for some reason, are giving relief on a steep cart path, and we know that the ball is just going to roll off the cart path, and really we're just trying to get the ball back in play for the player. So they drop it. We catch it and it's still in the relief area, but we know it's going to roll 30 feet down the hill. And then they drop a second time and we catch it. Then we go to placing it. Really what we're going to end up doing is trying to get them probably off that cart path. So that's what the rules are helping us there. Any questions on that? On uh, 14, three. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, in the first schematic, which has the four... Uh, pictures, uh, two correct, two non-correct um, of dropping the ball. Uh, the, guy, the guy bending over in the bottom right, it says it's incorrect. Why? So I think you're talking about this one. It's below correct. the height. It's below. So this is his knee height. And then this is, did you see my mouse on the screen? Yes. Okay. You see here is knee height and he's below knee height. Oh, okay. So that's why they're saying this is incorrect. Thank you. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's knee height when the player is standing. They tried to write it. They really tried to write these rules to, to help reduce penalties, but also they didn't want people to cheat them. So I think they did a great job. Any other questions on dropping the ball in the relief area? Again, as a rules official, rule 14 is the most common one that you need to know. When a player's ball is back in play after the original ball was out of play, uh, the teen area is one of those instances when the original ball or another ball is played. Any other area of the course when the ball is replaced or dropped with the intent of the ball going back into play. So I need to get back in here. So. So when a player's ball is lifted from the course or is lost or out of bounds, they have to get their ball back into play. And even if it's wrongly substituted or in wrong place, it's back in play. Even if the ball marker is still in play, your ball is in play. So these, these times your ball is back in play. Correcting mistake made and substituting or placing or dropping. So you have the racer rule. An error can be corrected as long as a stroke has not been made. So if you drop it from shoulder height, we can correct that and, and not be penalized as long as we did not play it. And when a player changes rules options, used a wrong rule, so they need to, or used a right rule, but put ball in play in wrong place, must stay within the rule and pick a right place, but can change the options if there are more than one available. Or if they use a right rule, an option must be option, but must drop or place again, must stay with a rule and option, but may be able to change the location under that option. So we can drop in a different area in the relief here. Making a stroke from a previous stroke is made. So from anywhere in the teen area, the ball may be teed. 
We know that that's any time we're playing from the teen area now. General area, penalty area, bunker, the ball must be dropped within a one club length relief area. So this picture two, we get one club length or in the bunker, one club length. And then on the putting green, we're going to place it. So if I put this ball off the green down into this bush and I decide it's probably going to be best for me to try to make that putt again, I take my unplayable one stroke penalty and I'm playing from where a previous stroke is made. I'm going to place it on this green. I'm not going to drop it. I will place it on the putting green. Ball must be played as it lies unless a rule permits or requires moving it. So general penalty applies if you play from the wrong place. And no correction is needed. So uh, wrong ball, we must correct. Wrong place, we're going to get away with, ex for, except for one exception for that. And we'll talk about that. And the wrong place is any place in the course other than where the player is required or allowed to play his or her ball under the rules. Examples of playing from wrong place are playing a ball after replacing it on the wrong spot or without replacing it when required by the rules. Playing a dropped ball from outside the relief area. And we've already kind of talked about those. Taking relief under a wrong rule so the ball is dropped in and played from a place not allowed under the rules. Or playing a ball from a no play zone or when a no play zone interferes with player's area of intended stance or swing. Those are wrong plays. Playing a ball from outside the teen area and starting the play of a hole or trying or in trying to correct that mistake is not playing from a wrong place. That's playing from outside the teen area. Ball must be played as it lies unless a rule permits or requires moving it. If played from a wrong place, the penalty for playing from a wrong place is now under this rule and not the rule that the player is operating. So it's a gen and it, the wrong place is a general penalty. I just said, so we never correct the wrong place except, except, except when there is a significant advantage. So player must decide what to do. They can play out the hole with the ball played from the wrong place. If it's not a serious breach, that's what we're going to do. We're going to correct it if it is a serious breach. And if they're uncertain, we play out the hole with both balls. And so let me go back to that. So here's a serious breach. We hit this tree. Here's where our ball is. We hit this tree. It bounces back into this yellow penalty area. And we'll talk about the, this rule later, but we cannot drop on this side of the penalty area. That's a significant advantage by dropping on this side of the water. So in this scenario, we would need to correct our wrong place. So if the player comes up here, hits and Let's say you drive in your cart, you're sitting over here, you have no idea, but they, they hit from here onto the green and then they turn to you and say, hey, I hit this tree and my ball went in the water here, I dropped here, is that correct? You get, the, you get the fun part of telling them that's not correct, you played from the wrong place and we need to actually correct that. So you'll help them with that. And the definition of a serious breach they give us some ideas of what, what is a serious breach in stroke play when playing from a wrong place could give the player a significant advantage compared to the stroke to be made from the right place. And making this comparison to decide if there was a serious breach, the factors to be taken into account include the difficulty of the stroke, the distance of the ball from the hole, the effect of obstacles on line of play, and the conditions affecting the stroke. So those are the four different factors that we're going to look into uh, take into account when we're trying to decide if it was a serious breach. And the concept of serious breach does not apply in match play because a player loses the hole. So uh, general penalty for match play is wrong play. So we really in match play don't care what your sob story is. You played from a serious breach and uh, you're going to lose that hole. And I tried in the high school state championships, they called us or actually it was the Regionals, they called us a player played from behind a green, thinking that it was a red penalty area. And I tried everything I could to uh, to get Rusty to say that it was okay. And Rusty said, no, it's not. It was a serious breach because she had lost her ball behind the putting green and it was she had hit her tee shot from 
250 yards away, actually over the green. And so it was a pretty serious breach to be able to allow her to just drop there. Ended up actually having to disqualify the player. So because they had gone on to the next hole. So she wasn't even able to correct it. And how she should have done it had she not gone to the next hole is uh, report, report the facts to the committee. If the player either plays out of the hole with a play from correct place or plays out the hole with both balls. And like I said, she, she had not, but in both cases, we need to report the facts to the committee. And then the committee will decide the player's fate. So if there's no serious breach, we'll, we'll count the ball scored from the wrong place with two penalty strokes. If the series breach, if it's not corrected, the player is disqualified and the score with the ball played in correcting the error counts, two stroke penalty. So had she been able to correct it, she would have just got the two stroke penalty from the wrong place and then gone back and corrected it. And it wouldn't matter how many shots she played as long as she went back and corrected it, she was just going to get a two stroke penalty. And the second ball was also played from the wrong place, rinse and repeat. So that was pretty wordy. 14 7 can get confusing, especially with how many different factors can come into play there. They try to give you those four situations that count for it and when it becomes a serious breach and when it does not. Any questions on 14? I'm going to move into. I'll move into bunkers real quick. I'm, well, for we bunkers and then break, or I can't remember. I don't know. I guess we're not really doing breaks because anybody can just get up and walk away at any time. But so bunkers, when it when your ball is in a bunker, 12-1. This should say 12-2. When your ball touches two parts of the course, I was supposed to proofread these. I missed the 12-2 there. Playing your ball in a bunker, things you can remove, restrictions or touching the sand. So significant changes in 2019. We can remove loose impediments in a bunker. Limited the pro, prohibitions on touching sand and then back on the line option for unplayable, which gets you out of the bunker with the two-stroke penalty. And then the margins of the bunker. The bunker is one of the five defined areas of the course. It is a specially prepared area of sand from which turf or soil was removed. Clarifications, things that are not part of the bunker. So they clarify this, a lip, wall, or face. I remember how confusing it was my first couple of years trying to decide what it was. The inside the edge of the bunker, any growing or attached natural objects. So inside the bunker here, th these are not, this is not the bunker, the church pews here. Inside the edge of the bunker is soil. And then sand that has spilled over the outside is not part of the bunker. So here, I, I, I try to figure out what hole this was at Pinehurst number two, but I couldn't figure it out. But uh, here, uh, this is not part of the bunker. This is outside of, oh, I know which one it is, at number six, right? The dog leg right or whatever, or seven. But I always hook it left. All right. So other things that are not part of the bunker, other areas of sand not part of the bunker. So here between holes 14 and 15 or 13 and 14 this sand here is not part of the bunker when your ball is inside the edge of the bunker when, or i'm sorry when your ball is in a bunker so this is how when your ball is in a bunker when your ball is inside the edge of the bunker it touches sand on the ground or on the ground where sand would be so just because it's washed away and it's touching dirt soil over here, you're still in the in the bunker. When your ball is in the inside of the bunker, if it's in or on a loose impediment, so we're still in the bunker here, just because it's laying on a bunch of leaves. If a bunker rake's in the bunker and our ball is on it, we are still in the bunker. Okay, our ball is still deemed to be in the bunker, even though it's on the movable obstruction. And if our ball is in this huge abnormal course condition, it is still deemed to be in the bunker. Or if it's on an integral part, integral object. So 
we define this as integral object. So still inside the margin of the bunker, we would uh, say your ball is in the bunker there. When your ball is not in a bunker, if without touching sand, your ball lies on soil, grass, so here, we're on the grass there, growing or attached natural object. So if there's a tree growing from the bunker and your ball is in the tree, if your ball touches both a bunker and another area of the course, it is treated as in the bunker except when it also touches a penalty area. So if my ball is touching the red line here, in there, that's supposed to say 12-2-C as well. You may, now this is the big change that I love. When you may remove without penalty, you may remove loose impediments now from the bunker. You can move movable objects, which you always could do that. But. Touching the sand, so you, I'm sorry, so we kind of briefed over that. So that is important to note. You can remove loose impediments as long as you do not cause your ball to move in a bunker. Touching the sand can result in penalty when you deliberately touch the sand to test its condition. So we saw that caddy out there uh, abandoned, went in there. And, uh, I, I can't remember, the U.S. junior or U.S. Maybe the U.S. amateur, but the caddy went in there and deliberately touched the sand to test its condition. Just had no idea uh, what they were doing. So that is still a penalty. Making practice swings. You can't stand over there and take a bunch of practice swings. Always joke, my dad's favorite was when making your back swing with the club. My dad had those cavity back callaways, and there was always sand flying over his head when he was hitting out of a bunker. I never called a penalty on him, but it is a penalty. And touching the sand can result in a penalty when you touch the sand with your club right in front of or right behind the ball. So that is a penalty. I believe that was asked in the chat earlier, and it is a penalty. So you can touch the sand if you're searching for your ball. So use your club searching for the ball or removing loose impediments or movable obstructions. Touching the sand is not a penalty, though. Here's our free times when we're digging in with our feet to take our stance that's common we see people do that all the time smoothing to care for the course which rusty mentioned earlier uh somebody i walked around the bunker to get a rake and somebody left a couple footprints in the bunker oh let me just take care of that while i'm standing right here placing equipment or other objects in there so if you go in there with two wedges i got my 60 degree and my 56 degree i'm not sure which one i want to use i toss my 56 down and I have my 60 in my hand and I say, man, I'm going to pop this straight up with my 60. Maybe I should use my 56. Well, then I'm going to bend over, pick up my 56 from the ground and place my 60. That's okay. We're okay doing that. Either way, I'll probably blade it over the bunker, but at least I went in there with two clubs thinking I knew what I was doing. And then it's not a penalty to measure, mark, lift, or replacing when you're doing any of those actions. So if I'm taking an unplayable in the bunker and I bring my driver and I'm measuring two club lengths with my driver, it's okay that I touch the sand. I'm not trying to do anything to gain an advantage. I'm just trying to measure out my two club lengths. Or the other scenario would have been, and we all, I don't know, you all probably watch a lot of golf like myself, The that playoff the other day uh, when uh, he did not mark his ball in the bunker because he was not asked to, but let's say he was asked to mark his ball to get it out of uh, Luke's way. then. Um, I can't even remember who it was, but uh, he would have been able to mark, we would have been able to touch the sand because he has to mark his ball. We're taking actions under a rule. Leaning on a club. So if you're leaning on a club or you fall over into the bunker, it's okay. And then striking the sand in frustration or anger. I love they threw this one in, but here's Chris. I finally decided with my 60 degree, I pop it straight up in the air. It gets just out of the bunker and starts rolling back in and just like Chris always does, he slams his club in the sand in frustration. Thanks to the USGA, I no longer am penalized. So. Playing your ball in a bunker, once your ball is outside the bunker, you may touch the sand without penalty, smooth sand to care for the course without penalty. And this is true even when you take stroke and distance back in the bunker. So if I blast my uh, wedge out of 
I've thin it over the green. I'm not paying attention. I'm all mad. I grab the rake that I laid right there next to me. I rake my footprints and then I get up out of the bunker. I start walking over to look for my ball and it's out of bounds. I'm going to have to go back and take stroke and distance in that bunker. And Rusty didn't want to tell me. He wanted me to find out on my own because I was already mad. So he let me walk all the way over there, find my ball out of bounds, and then go all the way back to the bunker. And the improved area is now on your line of play from outside the bunker. So maybe I'm going back. Maybe I decide after I bladed it out of the bunker out of bounds, I'm going to take additional two-stroke penalty and go outside the bunker. So playing your ball in a bunker, things you can remove, restrictions on touching the sand. Any questions on, on any of those? You guys should really play around a golf with Rusty and I. It really helps you learn the rules a lot more, not only because we call penalties on each other, but because we find ourselves in those types of situations. My favorite is to leave the ball behind the, the, the hole and say that I'm uh, not marking it to help him out and leave it there. All right, well, that's all I had for you all. Um, Got to pull up my agenda. I believe Brandon Hood is next, and then a five-minute break. Are we, Wolf? Did you want to do a five-minute break before Brandon? Maybe I'm just tired from talking so much, but. All right, well, I'll run down the hall and get Brandon. It looks like he unmuted himself. Brandon, you on? It's probably going to take us five minutes to get Brandon up here and running. He's working on getting his computer connected. Testing. And uh, yeah, testing. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we're good. We're good. All right. All good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here again. Uh, I'm just going to do a brief overview of what we're discussing um, today. The putting greens. We're going to talk about when your ball is on the putting green. Actions that are allowed when your ball is on the putting green. Actions that are not allowed. Uh, what happens if your ball or ball marker moves? And then uh, if you find yourself on a wrong putting green. So first, we're just gonna go quickly define yeah. what putting green is. It's one of the five defined areas of the course, uh, specifically prepared for putting. 
or if uh, the committee deems a temporary green is being used. So when is your ball on the punting green? When any part of the ball touches the punting green, is inside the edge of the punting green, or lies in or on anything on the punting green. So if your ball is on a leaf um, on the punting green, it's still considered on the green. If your ball happens to touch the putting green and the general area, it's considered to be on the putting green. But if your ball touches the putting green in any other specific area on the course, it is not on the putting green. So if we have a penalty area running right up to the edge of the putting green and your ball just happens to touch part of that red line, um, your ball is considered in the penalty area at that point, not on the putting green. And then we've got a video here for you. Takes a second to load. Wow, he might actually be closer than me for once. Bet it is. Finally. Let's go see how close. Man, I am glad I am not you right now. I picked the right hole to hit it close. Talk about a messy green. I gotta move all this stuff out of the way now? No, you don't actually. You can just hit your putt, go ahead. No, I'm gonna clean it up, obviously. I can't putt through that. Sure you can. No, there's sand, leaves, there's ball marks. I gotta fix all that before I putt here. You can go you're ahead and put it if you want. Anything up? All you're gonna do of course is. Of I am. No. What are you talking about? There's leaves. There's there's ball marks and damage yeah, all over the green. Fine. I can't. It's gonna Hit take a, a weird bounce. It's not gonna, That's not okay. Shut hey, it up. You can remove any of these loose impediments off of the putting green, no problem. You can use your hand. You can use your towel. Heck, you can even use a vacuum cleaner. You can also fix any damage on the putting green as well, even if it's a spike mark, a ball mark, even animal prints. See, told you. Whatever. Have fun. All right. All right, so that just shows some of the things you can remove. Um, I'd probably advise against the vacuum cleaner. I feel like that might delay play a little bit. Um, but yeah, you can remove those things if you want. Uh, we're just gonna quickly talk about damage on the punting green. So things caused by a person or outside influence. So that includes ball marks, shoe damage, uh, scrapes, indentations, old hole plugs, um, cut turf, animal tracks, and embedded objects are considered damage that can be repaired on the putting green. Damage does not include uh, maintenance practices such as aeration holes um, or effects of irrigation, rain or natural forces. So if the rain washes out part of the green, um, that does not that is not considered damage that can be repaired. Or natural surface imperfections or natural wear of the hole. Um, so like if we have a growth issue on the green, you're not allowed to repair that. Or if natural wear of the hole, you're not allowed to try to repair the hole. So now we're going to discuss some actions that are not allowed on the punting green. So you cannot deliberately test the punting green by rubbing the surface, rolling a ball, and this also applies on a wrong green and while play is stopped. Uh, but you can rub the surface, uh, for example, uh, between the play of two holes. So you've already holed out and you're going to the next uh, tee.
So if the ball or ball marker on the green is moved by you, uh, you're going, you're not going to get a penalty for accidental movement of your ball or ball marker. Um, except if the ball moves during the stroke or backstring or backswing and the stroke is made. So if you take your backswing and the ball moves a little bit and you complete the swing, um, you are not going to replace that ball. If the ball is moved by natural forces, uh, after you have lifted and replaced, so you've marked, you've lifted and you replaced, you own that spot since you've marked it, um, you're just gonna put it back. If you have not marked it, so you do not own that spot on the punting green yet, you're gonna play it from its new spot, so you're gonna play it as it lies. So it's very important um, whether you have or have not marked your golf ball yet, whether you're gonna be able to replace or play as it lies. If your ball marker is moved by natural forces, always put it back. So if you've marked your ball, uh, clearly you own that spot again. So you're just gonna put it back. Wrong putting greens, unfortunate situation, blow it way right, you're on the wrong, wrong green. Um, when you have interference, you must take free relief from a wrong putting green. If you play your ball as it lies, you're unfortunately going to get the general penalty for playing off of a wrong green. So the interference exists when your ball touches a wrong green, lies in or in, in or on anything inside the wrong green, or the wrong green uh, interferes with your cast conditions affecting the stroke, stance, swing, live ball. So in taking relief, um, it's just going to be, you're just going to find your nearest point of relief. You're going to drop in your relief area and then you're going to play it. But no relief when interference achieved is clearly unreasonable, such as your stance, club or swing, direction of play. Um, not sure what would be on putting green to keep that from happening, but um, yeah, if it's clearly unreasonable, you do not get relief. We're going to roll right along into flag sticks. So status of the flag stick, uh, left in the hole, removed. If you strike the flag stick and ball resting against the flag stick, ball overhanging the hole, It's froze. So we're just going to go over the definition of flag stick real quick. So it's a movable pole placed in the hole provided by the committee. Pretty simple there. So you're allowed to leave the flag stick in the hole um, for any stroke from anywhere. And no penalty if your ball strikes the flag stick. There's big change 2019 helped the pace of play, in my opinion. So Good change, um, but if you do hit the flag stick, you're just going to play your ball as it lies. If you do decide to leave the flag stick in the hole, you cannot deliberately position it um, other than centered, so you can't try to lean it to one side um, if you're trying to putt see, uh, to affect your putt. And the penalty applies if you strike the flag stick. So if you've, if you've leaned the flag stick and your ball happens to hit it, you are going to get a penalty for that. And you're not allowed to deliberately move the uh, flag stick while the ball is in motion. Um, but no penalty if the movement was for any other reason. Example, you don't think your ball was uh, going to hit the flag stick. You thought it was breaking a different way. You thought there was no way it was going to come to the hole. So you just remove the flag stick and it uh, happens to uh, strike it. So no authorization to move flag stick. You have no right to move it. So if another player removes the flag stick without your knowledge, before you make your stroke, during your stroke, or while your ball is in motion, 
um, that player is going to get the general penalty for removing the flag stick without your knowledge. But no penalty again if the movement was for some other reason. Again, reasonable belief that your ball would not strike the flag stick. Or they did not know you're about to play, so you've got a 60 foot putt and they're not paying attention and your ball's in motion and they pull the flag stick not knowing, um, they're not going to get a penalty for that. So before a stroke, you may remove the flag stick, have it attended to be removed, or have it held up above the hole so you can't see the hole and someone can hold up the flag stick to help you line up your putt. So quick definition of uh, authorized attendance. Your caddy is holding the flag stick, standing next to the hole. Or you ask anyone to attend the flag stick. So if you see another person holding the flag stick or standing next to the hole. Um, so as whereas before we were talking about you didn't know, so the other player is going to uh, get the penalty but you see another person, so you now know that they are attending it. Um, so they're considered to have authorized attendance. So striking an attendant or <clears throat> removed flag stick, accidental strike, easy as that, no penalty. Just gonna play it as it lies. But if you deliberately strike a removed flag stick, uh, rule 11.2 is gonna apply you're going to get the general penalty. So if you put your flag stick behind the hole to kind of use it as a backstop, um, that is going to be a penalty. So if you made this stroke anywhere except the putting green, you're going to estimate where the ball would have come to rest. So if you're chipping and you put the flag stick behind the hole to try to stop it, um, and it does hit the flag stick, you're going to estimate where it would have come to rest. If you think that spot is on the putting green, you're just going to place on that estimated spot. But if it had a lot of speed and you think it might have rolled to the opposite um, rough area, you're going to drop in a relief area. But if you made the stroke from, uh, from the putting green, so you're putting, flag sticks behind the hole, using it as backstop again, you have to cancel the stroke and replay from the original spot. And remember, this is for deliberate actions. So uh, using it as like a backstop or purposely not accidental. When your ball is resting against the flag stick, if any part of the golf ball is below the surface of the green, the ball is considered hold. Even if the entire ball is not below the surface. So in this picture here, the ball will be considered hold because part of the ball is below the surface of the green. If no part is below the surface of the green, the ball is not hold, and you just play it as it lies. If your ball is overhanging the hole, you're allowed a reasonable time to reach the hole, long 60 footer, and it's overhanging, you're allowed to walk up to the ball. You get that time plus an additional 10 seconds to see if the ball is going to fall into the hole. So if your ball falls into the hole during the 10 second waiting period, that's great. You fold out with your previous stroke. If the ball does not fall into the hole in that 10 second waiting period. It's treated as being at rest. And if it falls into the hole after that, before your next stroke, um, it's considered hold with your previous stroke, but you are gonna get a one stroke penalty. So it's as if it's at rest and you just tapped it in. If before the 10 seconds is up, someone else uh, deliberately lifts or moves your ball. So the example in this, uh, in match play, your ball is considered whole with the last stroke. So you tap it to the edge, it's overhanging, it's been two seconds and the opponent picks it up. Um, it's considered hold with that last stroke. And there's no penalty to anybody, it's just considered hold. But in stroke play, 
Uh, the player responsible, the player that picked up the ball is going to get the general penalty. They're going to get two strokes for picking up your ball. And you replace your ball and play out from there. Any questions on punting green or flag stick? Okay, so we're gonna move into free relief. Um, so I'm gonna go over loose impediments uh, real quick and I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Wolf and he's gonna cover movable obstructions, ball or ball marker helping or interfering with play, abnormal course conditions, dangerous animal conditions, embedded ball, and lifting your ball to see if a relief condition applies. So first with loose impediments, we need to know what a loose impediment is. So the definition of a loose impediments, removing loose impediments, what happens if your ball moves when removing, Okay, so loose pediments may be moved anywhere, including as we just saw from Chris Day, uh, bunkers. You can move loose impediments in penalty areas. That was a big change. But it's key to note that sand and loose soil are not loose impediments. So the quick definition un uh, are unattached natural objects such as stones, loose grass, leaves, branches, Sticks, dead animals, or dead an or animal waste. So, uh, dead bird next to your ball, that's considered a loose impediment. If you want to remove that, you're allowed to. So, worms, insects, and similar animals uh, that can be easily removed. Mounds and webs that they build, and those are all considered loose impediments. But these uh, following are not considered loose. You get no relief for anything attached, growing, uh, solidly embedded in the ground. So um, a rock that's just embedded in the ground or something sticking to the ball. So uh, loose grass stuck to your ball, that is not considered loose. You cannot pick off the grass from your golf ball. So there are a couple special cases. Number one, um, so like we said, sand, loose soil, dew, frost, or water are not loose impediments. Special cases, again, uh, snow and natural ice other than frost. The player is going to get the choice here. So they can call it a loose impediment or they can deem it as temporary water when it's on the ground. And that's snow and natural ice. That's not frost. Last special case is spider webs. Um, even though they're attached to another object, um, spider webs specifically are considered uh, loose impediments. So again, removing loose impediments, they may be removed anywhere on or off the golf course in any way. But of course, there's always exceptions in the rules of golf. So uh, you are not allowed to remove loose impediments where your ball must be replaced. So if you're um, searching for your golf ball and you accidentally kick your ball um, and you have to replace it, you're not allowed to remove loose impediments where your ball is supposed to be replaced. And that also applies when play is stopped, but it does not apply on the putting green. And you're not allowed to deliberately remove a loose impediment to affect a ball in motion. So you chip onto the green and it's rolling back and you see a stick on your line. Um, the ball's in motion, you cannot remove that loose impediment to affect your ball in motion. So if your ball moves uh, when you're trying to remove a, a loose impediment, your ball has to be replaced. And unfortunately you are going to get a one stroke penalty if your ball is in a general area, bunker, or penalty area. Exceptions, so times you're not going to get a penalty. If your ball's on the punting green, the teeing area, or while you're searching, or any other exceptions in 9.4b. Does anybody have any questions on loose impediments, flag sticks, punting greens, anything of that nature before 
Uh, I don't know if we're still going to break Chris Wolf, um, if you're in here, but um, I'm going to turn it over to him to cover. No, we'll, we'll skip the break and just keep it moving. If you need to step away, we understand that, but we'll just keep moving. All right. um, so if you could unshare your screen, I'll share mine, and then we'll keep going. All right, does that look correct? Yep. All right, I will pick up with movable obstructions. So we'll talk about what they are, um, when you can remove the movable obstructions, and when you need to move the ball versus when the ball is in, lost in or on a movable obstruction. and options when your ball is not found in or on the movable obstruction. So our definition, the obstruction is any artificial object. Our most common example is our cart path. Um, two exceptions are things that are categorized as integral objects or boundary objects. A movable obstruction is an obstruction that can be moved with reasonable effort without damaging the obstruction itself and without damaging the course. Most often we're seeing stakes, uh, a golf cart, waste containers, um, any type of player equipment, flag sticks, or I think the rake is our, our favorite example. Movable parts of the immovable obstruction are treated as a movable obstruction, uh, except when the movable part is not meant to be moved. Um, so these guys are working on, working on a uh, bulkhead. Um, part of it is movable. Um, but that part is not meant to be moved. You're not supposed to be able to pull that, that wood off of there. Um, so that would all be treated as an immovable obstruction. So there's a lot of very simple ways we can move and, and take, get relief from the movable obstruction. Uh, if you can easily move the, the movable obstruction without penalty, you can move it any, without penalty anywhere on or off the course. Our two exceptions are T markers when you're playing the ball in that teeing area or to deliberately affect a ball in motion. Um, so in this case, uh, a caddy thought he was helping, unfortunately moved a rake and trying to let the ball go down into the penalty area um, and, uh, and made the situation worse. So our movable obstruction relief, um, you, your ball comes to rest against the rake here, um, just place a T next to the ball. You move the rake. If the ball moves, there's no penalty, and the player is allowed to replace the ball on the original spot. Um, if you move the rake and the ball doesn't move, then that's the easiest one. You just keep moving to take the tee out of the ground, and the ball is, is back in play. If the original spot is not known, we're going to estimate the spot and replace on that spot. So um, we're replacing the ball on that spot um, um, because the ball is going back to that position. Um, as opposed to dropping in the old days. We got another Jay Roberts video um, here. I think Jay said he might um, be joining us. I'm not sure if he did. If he if he's here, thank you very much for all your work with these videos. Um, and uh, at the end of the day today, um, I'm going to send everyone a little bit of a recap video. Uh, we'll have links to um, all the Jay Roberts videos and all of the California Golf Association videos. Um, if you want to go through those. We have an interesting scenario here because my ball came to rest on this rake, which is a movable obstruction. I do get free relief from it, but there is a certain procedure we have to use to get that relief. So first of all, I have to mark the reference point, which is the estimated spot on the ground right under where my ball is currently at rest. So to mark that spot, I'm allowed to lift my ball and move the rake I'm going to mark the spot. Now from this reference point, I get a one club length relief area that's no closer to the hole and is in the same area of the course where my reference point is. So there are five areas of the course. You've got the teeing area, penalty areas, bunkers, putting green, and the general area. 
So if the same situation happened, but in the bunker, my reference point underneath the ball would be in the bunker. So I'd have to drop my ball in the bunker. My reference point is in the general area, which means I have to drop the ball in the general area. One club length relief, which is the longest club in your bag. That's not your putter. For most of us, that's our driver. I've got my driver right here. So I'm gonna measure out really quickly. One club length, that's no closer to the hole. From here, I'm gonna correctly drop my ball from knee height. It has to land in and come to rest in the general area. This ball is now in play, no penalty, play on. All right, so using the, the example, same example, um, using a towel in this case, um, you're just lifting the ball and the obstruction, dropping the original or another ball. And that reference point is, except for when you're on the putting green, the reference point is estimated under where the ball was. And that will be the same one club relief area. And you're dropping in the same area of the course as the reference point, not nearer to the hole. In the situation where um, the ball's in or on an obstruction on the putting green, you're doing all the same things except for you're placing the original um, or another ball right under that spot. So relief for a ball that's not found with knowledge or virtual certainty. Um, some of the uh, unlikely situations where say a ball flies into this um, Powerade uh, cooler container um, and, and you're certain, you know, say there's another group on the tee, they said, oh yeah, it definitely it flew right in there. Um, can't find the ball, you don't, don't have to dig through all the ice to get down there to get the ball. Relief is allowed. Your reference point is estimate, the estimated point under where the ball last crossed the outer edge um, of, that, of the, um, the cooler in this case. And then you're taking the relief area using the applicable, applicable rule. Um, so in this case, the general area part, part of that rule. So if you do not have knowledge or virtual certainty, um, relief is not allowed. Um, say you hit a ball over a hill, uh, there's a big movable obstruction up there, um, but you're not quite sure if the ball went into that area. It would be used much of the same um, standards of, of knowledge or virtual certainty as you would a ball going into a penalty area, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so if you do, do not have that knowledge of virtual certainty, you can't operate under this rule and you need to go back and play under stroke of distance. Questions there? Uh, so Ben Moffitt asked a question and actually I meant to talk about this at the beginning. Um, we'll give Ben um, some of the, uh, the attention he deserves. Um, if you couldn't join us for golf night um, this past weekend, Ben was the recipient of the Charles E. Lynch um, Distinguished Service Award for this EGA. Uh, about 2016, I think, we started a Distinguished Service Award um, for contributions and volunteer contributions to the CGA. And Ben was a very deserving, deserving um, recipient this year. We also have Ben Payne and Larry McQueen, our past recipients, uh, I think, are with us today. So wanted to um, try and embarrass Ben a little bit and, uh, and also thank him for everything he does for the CGA. Uh, so he's asking about split rail fences. If the rails are merely resting in a hole in the fence post, are the rails, are the rails movable obstructions or immovable obstructions? Does the answer differ if the fence posts on the fence are considered boundary objects? So if the fence posts are boundary objects and we're using the, the inside part of the, the fence, um, then you would not be able to move those fence posts, I believe. Um, if the rails are merely resting, so it goes back to they're, they're not designed to be moved. The split rail fence is supposed to be set into place. Um, so I would say that you could not move them. They're meant to be in place, but um, I'm open to other opinions. Rusty, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, obviously we don't define every obstruction out there. So in general, if you go to the definitions, um, if the obstruction cannot be moved without unreasonable effort and without damaging the obstruction or course, then it would be immovable. So in this particular case, if we didn't say that 
hey, the split rail fences are either movable or immovable. And I'm thinking of, I think here at Pine Needles, you know, they have some with just spikes in them that are easily moved around. But if it's like a, a four by four post hole bin, maybe in your example, and just a split rail fence is just in the hole in the ground in that case, um, you know, even though we may, we haven't defined it as anything, I would say that that can be moved without unreasonable effort and without damaging that obstruction or course. So you could pull that uh, split rail fence that's just stuck in that, that larger hole in the ground. But contrast it to if it's a four by four post in the ground, um, trying to take that out, well, that's gonna take some unreasonable effort and potentially damage the course further than what that little hole is there. So then it would be an immovable by definition there. So. Um, I don't know if that covers exactly what you're you're saying, but I agree with uh, you, Wolf. That yeah, boundary object. If it if we say that that split rail fence defines a boundary, um, then it's you know can't can't move it in that case. But uh, but does that answer kind of where you were going there, Ben? Um, well, the reason I brought the question up is it happened to me about five or six years ago in the tournament, and uh, it was a junior girls tournament, and the girls. Uh, ball was right underneath the railing uh, but the fence to find out of bounds and the parent said she can move that can't she and I said no that's a, a boundary object it's immovable and he said where does it show that uh, to me on the local rule sheet and I didn't have an answer for him I said because that's the interpretation and the way it's played <laughs> which he didn't like that answer but uh, anyway <laughs> So. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, now they've have some further defined terms that, you know, that, hey, we're saying this fence is out of or defines out of bounds. So that means it's a boundary object. So, yeah, it's, it's not as clean, but, you know, we have to kind of talk them through it now and get them there to that point. Yeah. I, it, it just, it said to me, it's one of those things. If you are running a tournament and you've got something like that, it, it's in your best interest to define what you do with that with that split rail fence this this one was at rock hill country club is our call um yeah. which has a lot of them out there so our south carolina amateur match plays there this year so i'll make a note of that to uh, okay. keep an eye on that but uh, <laughs> but yeah you're right ben i mean we try to define especially if it's ambiguous where i mean it's pretty clear that you know certain fences are immovable or or not but yeah if there's ever a where we need to just clear it up we try to put that on the rule sheet and catch all of those if at all possible to help you out but yeah not not all of them unfortunately get caught there so um and congratulations to you again ben i know i saw you on saturday but congrats again um thank you I was, a, I was i was blown away uh to re, i mean just I, it's, it's a great honor when i look at the names of the people who have received it previously they're they're total all-stars and i i personally I just I don't know how I got in there, but thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, another question, just while I'm on here on here talking, Chris Anderson uh, is marking the reference point a requirement or just good practice? And so, yeah, that's uh, um, it's it's a, a should I think still in this case, Chris, where um, it's not a requirement. You know, the only requirement is that we get that ball back in play um, in the relief area where you know from our nearest point of complete relief so um it's a good practice like you said especially if it's questionable about you know how far can i go but in general if i'm an official out there and um you know maybe depending on the level of the play but if it's a, a senior championship and the, the ball's on the right side of the cart path the player walks over there picks it up steps over you know one step to the right of the path you know cleans it off drops it at knee height and hits it i'm not going to go over there and say hey you didn't mark your nearest point of complete relief he kind of did everything in reasonable judgment and, and got the ball, you know, more than likely within that designated relief area and, and proceeded on. If he, if the player picked it up and went to the other side and I was worried that it wasn't their nearest point of complete relief, then I would intervene. But, uh, but yeah, not a requirement, just a good practice for sure. And it's a good practice when you're teaching, especially newer golfers, maybe how to, how to follow this procedure and, and do it correctly there. All right, sorry to ramble on there, Wolf. I'll let you take it back. That's all right. You're doing great. All right, we'll keep moving. So we'll head on to uh, ball or ball, ball marker helping or interfering. 
um, when the ball is on the putting green or anywhere else on the course, um, as well as a ball marker. So ball helping play and the very popular example um, a couple of years ago was a ball serving as a possible backstop um, applies only to balls that are on the putting green. If it's your ball, you may mark and lift it. And if it's another player's ball, you or any other player uh, can require, can ask that that ball be lifted. In stroke play, if two or more players agree to leave the helping ball in place and then the stroke is made, uh, the green players get the general penalty. And as an alternative to lifting, the player who is, is required to lift may also play first um, in our stroke play example. In match play, opponents may agree to leave the helping ball in place. Um, we'll do a little bit more match play tomorrow. Um, a lot of the rules are, are different. Um, but in this case, the, the players are allowed to, to just do to, um, to agree to, to leave that helping ball in place um, in this situation. So our, it, what is the definition of interference? Um, the ball may hey, interfere with your stance. Hey, Chris Wolf, Sweet. one sec. Um, it looks like there's a big block blocking half your screen right now. Hmm. You got to move your chat box off, Chris. Let me see. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so interference is, it might interfere with the stance swing or a reasonable chance after a stroke. Uh, it could hit the ball at rest. Or it's close enough to distract the player from making the stroke. The procedure we'll operate under is the player next to play can require that interfering ball to be marked and lifted. And like you said, in stroke play, the interfering ball can be played first instead. Um, the player of the interfering ball cannot lift the ball without being asked, um, except on the putting green. Obviously, you always have the opportunity to, to mark and lift your own ball. Um, going back to our Will Zalatoris, Luke List um, example, uh, when they were playing out of the bunker right next to each other, um, I think there were a lot of questions, a lot of people that didn't quite understand the rule asking why Will Zalatoris, who was going to play second, didn't lift his own ball. Um, and the player who was away was Luke List. He did not ask Will to, to lift his ball. Um, so, in the, so the rule states the player with the interfering ball cannot lift it without being asked. So if Luke was, was willing to play with his ball um, that close to, to Will's ball, then he's allowed to do that. Um, and if Will had lifted his ball, then he would have been penalized for lifting his ball when not being asked to. Um, in all these cases, the ball may not be cleaned. You'll see the players um, either pick up the ball and put it down in another spot, or they like hold it with two fingers, make sure that they're um, making it obvious that they are not uh, cleaning the ball. If it's the ball marker itself, um, you can move it out of the way. Obviously, like we've all seen many times, um, just move it club length on either side, whatever it need to do to, to get it out of the way. Or if it belongs to another player, you can just ask them to move it. And we'll get into abnormal course conditions. When you get relief, how you take relief and relief for if the ball is not found. And we'll also talk about the relatively new concept of, play, of no play zones. So abnormal course condition is ground under repair, temporary water, uh, animal holes or immovable obstructions. Relief for holes, cast, and worn tracks made by any animal, uh, except the worms or insects. When do you have interference? Uh, relief is allowed when the ball touches, the ball is in or on, uh, it interferes with your stance, swing, or on the putting green only, your line of play. Distraction uh, in and of itself is not considered interference. And we got another J video here. So check this one out. I think this is a rule every golfer should know. I tugged my drive left into a bad spot next to these logs. And if I were to play it, it would interfere with my swing. It's not marked in any way. So am I SOL? 
Not even close. I can play this ball as it lies if I wanted to, but that's obviously not ideal. Or I can take free relief for ground under repair. Because if we look at the definition of ground under repair, certain things are ground under repair even if they're not marked as ground under repair. And that includes things like holes made by the committee or maintenance staff, animal habitats, and in this case, grass cuttings, leaves, and any other material piled for later removal. As you can see, there's clearly some maintenance going on in the area, evidenced by all of these freshly cut trees, which maintenance will surely remove as soon as they're able to. So in the meantime, I can treat this as ground under repair and take free relief. It's also worth noting that these logs are natural unattached objects, so they're also loose impediments. I could... repair relief. To take relief, I'm going to simulate my next stroke using my intended swing and my intended club to find the nearest spot where I no longer have interference. That spot becomes my nearest point of complete relief, and from there, I get a one club length relief area. Now, you'll notice that part of my relief area is cut off, preventing me from having a full semicircle relief area, and that's because if I dropped my ball in any part of the yellow portion of the graphic, I would still have swing interference and likely stance interference. And when you take relief, you must take complete relief so that you're free from all kinds of interference. So that is why the yellow portion of this graphic is not part of my relief area. I don't have to physically use my longest club to measure. I can estimate using any club. I just have to be sure to drop the ball within one club length. Since I'm taking relief, I can use the original ball or another ball. I drop it in the right way. The ball stayed at rest in the relief area. This ball is in play in the right place and I can make my next stroke. Now let's run this back and take a look at something. If you noticed, I left my club in the relief area when I dropped the ball, but I did this for demonstration purposes. It's not best practice to do this, but it's also not against the rules. It only becomes an issue if I deliberately position the club there for the purpose of stopping or deflecting the ball and the dropped ball struck the club. Subscribe to learn more golf rules. All right, so relief is allowed anywhere. So we have, except for these three exceptions, your ball is in the penalty area. The abnormal course condition is not on the course, uh, or it's cle clearly reasonable, unreasonable uh, stroke or decision choice of, of play um, that you're using to, to try and get that relief. Uh, we have our bunker relief procedure for free relief. Um, so there's some standing water um, in the bunker. You're taking your nearest point of complete relief, um, staying in that bunker. You have a one club length relief area, staying in that bunker, can't be nearer the hole than the reference point. And you're taking complete relief if possible. Um, like Jay talked about, you see the, the relief pie here um, is not necessarily a full um, 180 degree pie, um, but you're, you're moving to that nearest point right outside the abnormal course condition and dropping there. In the bunker example, if maximum relief, uh, is not, is not possible, there's so much water in the bunker, then we're taking um, as much relief as possible um, in that situation. You also have back on the line relief to get the ball outside of the bunker, um, going back to any part of the course. Sorry, let me go back. Um, just taking a, a straight line back um, from the flag through where the ball is to outside that relief area. Um, and then dropping within one club length of there. That's a one stroke penalty. On the punting green, um, in this case, we need a, a squeegee and some help from the, the maintenance crew. Um, the abnormal course condition is on the green. Your ball comes to rest in that, in that puddle. You're placing the original or another ball on that spot outside um, of the puddle. Um, the way it was taught to me is kind of treat this dotted line as if it was a string attached to the to the flag stick and you're just kind of walking around the clock to the nearest point outside of that puddle um, no closer to the hole and then that's where you're placing it uh, it must be on the putting green or you can move over into the general area um, if that's your the nearest point outside of, of the puddle or the, the the abnormal course condition that's affecting uh, the situation if no complete relief is avail available, then we're using the maximum available relief um, as the reference point. Um, like we said, could be it could end up taking you into the into the fringe, into the rough, whatever the case may be, off of the putting green. So, in abnormal course condition, the ball is not found. 
Um, with knowledge or virtual certainty, your starting point is the estimated point where the ball last crossed the outer edge. Uh, the nearest point of complete relief from the starting point from outside that is your is your reference point and your relief area um, often going to be the, the one club length we're using the applicable relief area described in the rule. And said without knowledge or virtual certainty cannot operate under this uh, under this rule and you have to go back under stroke and distance. We'll touch on no play zones. Um, no play zones are areas of the course that the committee has deemed um, players are not allowed to play from. Um, so obviously the ball must not be played. <clears throat> um, you have the option to mark a no play zone as a penalty area or as an abnormal course condition. Um, so in the case where we're, we're calling it abnormal course condition, free relief um, is required. Uh, for a dangerous animal condition, uh, I think we, uh, the alligator is our, is our favorite example. Um, when you're allowed relief and what your procedure is, um, this was actually taken down at True Blue in December. Um, Hogan and I were down there. A player came up to us at scoring and said, I didn't have to play this ball like this, right? I said, yes, that is correct. Um, so when, your animal, when the animal is near the ball and can cause serious physical injury to the player, um, if they were to go down and play it, uh, like I said, alligators are our favorite um, example we see often in South Carolina, but any type of snake, uh, hornet's nest, bees, fire ants, or if you got a bear just running straight across the middle of the fairway. So relief is allowed anywhere on the course. Two exceptions are when the stroke is clearly unreasonable, uh, where you're just, the player is just trying to get relief. Either their club, their stance, the swing, or what they're telling you, you know, I'm trying to hit the ball all the way back the wrong way, um, just trying to, to get relief that way. Um, but overall, I would say we would be we would err on the generous side for dangerous animal condition um, relief. We do not want anyone getting seriously injured at a CJ event. Our procedure um, is the nearest point of complete relief where the dangerous animal condition doesn't exist. Uh, so you're picking the spot where you think the alligator is no longer a threat and operating under the abnormal course condition relief procedure um, based on where your ball is, general area, bunker, um, or the putting green. In the penalty area, you're finding the nearest point of complete relief. And that relief area must be in that penalty area where the ball came to rest. And then obviously, um, if, if you want to, you can operate under the penalty area relief rule instead and just drop it outside the penalty area. Uh, we will touch on embedded balls. The definition and free relief based on where the ball is. So in the general area versus on the putting green and how we get the ball back into play. So the ball is embedded if it is in its own pitch mark as a result of your previous stroke, player's previous stroke, and part of the ball is below the surface of the ground. So it has to have broken down into the dirt and be below the level of the ground. So the ball is not embedded if it has, uh, after it came to rest, subsequently been stepped on, run over by a cart. Uh, Jack told us that he actually heard about this one time uh, recently. The ball was driven straight into the ground and never actually left the air um, as a result of dropping. Uh, if you can't tell if your ball is in its own pitch mark, pitch mark or another, um, you may treat the ball as embedded and take relief if it's reasonable to conclude from the, all the available information that you have that it's in its own pitch mark. Our reference point um, is a spot almost directly behind where the ball was embedded. And then you have your standard one club length relief area behind that, um, not near the hole. And staying in the, the balls in the general area are staying in the general area. Our exceptions are there's no relief for a ball embedded in sand, uh, which tends to happen from time to time, um, especially in the Pinehurst area. Uh, um, there's no relief if the ball is embedded in sand in part of the general area 
not cut to fairway height or less, so we get these kind of waste areas, sandy areas. Um, that would be an exception to the free relief. Or if interference from something else makes the stroke unreasonable. So ball is, is buried into the dirt here, but um, there's no reasonable way for them to, to have played the ball out from around this tree or behind this tree, uh, even if it had not been embedded. So in that, uh, in that situation, that they would not be entitled to free relief. And if your ball is embedded on the punting green, uh, usually that means you hit a good approach shot. Uh, so simple, set, simple case, you just uh, mark and lift your ball, repair the ball mark, and replace it on that original spot. <clears throat> In a situation where you're lifting to see if the ball is embedded, um, can be done anywhere, but must follow the procedure. Our uh, now infamous example of our friend Patrick Reed um, marked and lifted the ball to see if the ball was embedded in, in the rough here. So you can see, you can do that to, to see if the rule applies to you. Um, if, you're reasonable, if you have reasonable, reasonable, reason, reasonable reason to see if the, if the relief rule applies to you, um, but you cannot decide it without having otherwise lifted your ball. Um, you no longer have to announce that it's required. Probably a good idea. Um, we prefer if players tell other players in their group what's going on, um, but there's not an announcement. Uh, it, the announcement's not required anymore. So the ball must be marked before lifting. It cannot be cleaned until you determine um, if the relief uh, rule applies. And if you're not entitled to relief, you're just replacing the original ball um, in as, as close to the uh, you're recreating the lie in the situation as close as you can. Uh, one stroke penalty applies if you lift it without a reasonable um, reasonable chance that your ball could be embedded. If you fail to mark before lifting it, or if you clean it, um, and, and that rule and the free relief rule does not apply to you. And there's no penalty if you are entitled to, and you end up doing those things, but there, you are entitled to free relief, then there is no penalty. Questions there? Um, so Greg says, could you discuss washed out bunkers in relation to an abnormal course condition and options for free relief in or out of the bunkers? Yeah, so washed out areas so oftentimes um, the, a storm will come through um, during the course of play. We'll stop play. We'll come back out, um, and the bunkers are washed out. And we will oftentimes treat them as ground under repair. Um, that case, we're trying to. That's where it kind of talked about the maximum available uh, relief. That you might not necessarily be able to get full relief um, from the ground under repair, the abnormal course conditions. Um, but we're helping the player find the maximum available relief where they're not affected by the, the water or the washed out area. Um, there are situations where we've decided to treat all the bunkers completely as ground under repair. And in that case, they would get relief, free relief outside of the bunker. Um, but we try to avoid that. Have, can you discuss a known or virtual lost ball in a temporary water condition in the general area? Um, yeah, say we get a really bad rainstorm um, and there's a 20 foot wide puddle um, in the middle of the fairway and players tee off. They, they, they can see where their balls are landing in the fairway. They see a big splash in the middle of the puddle or like the puddle probably is not, a, not good enough. Say it's, it's a small pond in the middle of the fairway. Um, we're not going to make the player go into the, into the small pond to get the ball out of there um, if they if they, it's known or virtual certain that the ball is in there, they can play from the outside of that area. At Duke this year, we had uh, – it wasn't temporary water, but it was another abnormal course condition. They – right in the middle of 18 fairway, it was, uh, you know, about a you know, 15 by 15-yard 15 square that they – whether they were working on a sprinkler head or what, but it was all sand and new sides. It was real soft, and the side was, you know, real tall because they hadn't been cutting it. And the player hit their ball right down the middle of the fairway you know, go up there and there's no ball to be found anywhere. So we're all looking all around and, 
you know, finally we say, you know, you hit it down the middle of the fairway. It didn't run left or right. There wasn't a sloped fairway that, so it must have plugged in this soft sand or high kind of uh, sod right there. So we had knowledge or we were virtually certain that ball couldn't be anywhere else. We were 95% certain it was in that ground under repair um, area. So we, you know, went outside the outermost edge and took relief and kept going. So not temporary water, but in abnormal course condition, same thing. And then final question about um, taking relief from a no play zone. Um, so the difference between an abnormal course condition, no play zone and a penalty area, no play zone. Um, I need to dig into this one a little more honestly. Rusty, do you know? Um, yeah, so uh, no play zones in general. I think someone answered it actually pretty close. But if your oh, ball's yeah. not, um, you know, if your ball's not in, uh, if your ball's not in the penalty area, um, but you're interfered with by, you know, maybe tall reeds or whatever in the penalty area that's a no play zone, I think that someone hit it on the head that you're, you know, you must take free relief in that case. Um, to get away from it. Um, if your ball's in the penalty area, I think you have to stay in the penalty area. Um, and there are a couple other caveats under 16, uh, 16 F perhaps. I'm trying to pull it back up real quick here. Um, but I think uh, someone nailed it on the head there. Um, yeah, I see that, yeah. I scrolled yeah. down somewhere. Um, and then we also have yeah, a maximum available relief in the bunker. Um, yeah, sometimes it, it's it's not very helpful. Um, there there will be times where if the water is going all the way, almost close to the edge or up to the edge, um, they may have to drop in in the water to take the as much relief as they can. Um, but a lot of times in that situation, uh, we would get to the point where we can make the bunkers the, themselves ground under repair. Um, so hopefully we, we're not having to deal with that. But but yeah, you're. In, in theory, it is possible that you could have to drop the ball in the, the shallowest part of the water, whatever the case may be in that bunker. All right. I will hand it over to Tom Roth. And he'll finish us strong here. Good to go. Yeah, it looks good. Just move. Uh, yep, there you go. You're good to go. Good. All right. All right. So we got a few more to close out our session here today. So what I'll be going over is our penalty areas. Stroke and distance relief, uh, ball lost out of bounds and provisional ball, and then unplayable ball as well. To get into it, into it, our definition of penalty area, um, the options for ball in a penalty area, and then options for playing ball from penalty area, as well as no relief under other rules for ball in a penalty area. So first, our definition of a penalty area is any area from which relief with a one-stroke penalty is allowed if the player's ball comes to rest there. And then any body of water, including a sea, lake, pond, river, ditch, surface drainage ditch, or other open water course uh, will be our penalty areas. 
We also have any other part of the course the committee defines as a penalty area, and a penalty area is one of the five defined areas of the course. And then we got our two types of penalty areas. So we got our yellow penalty area, which you have two relief options, and then our red penalty area, which you have three options. Um, and then if the color of the penalty area has not been marked or indicated by the committee, it is treated as a red penalty area. Um, and then the edge of the penalty area extends both above the ground and below the ground. Uh, this means that any ground and anything else, such as any natural or artificial object, inside the edge of the penalty, part of the penalty area, whether on, above, or below the surface of the ground. And then the edge of the penalty area should be defined by stakes, lines, or physical features. So when it is defined by stakes, the edge of the penalty area is defined by the line between the outside points of the stakes at ground level and the stakes are inside the penalty area. And then if it is defined by lines, uh, if there's a pinned line on the ground, the edge of the penalty area is the outside edge of the line and the line itself is in the penalty area. And then if it is just defined by physical features, um, such as a beach or desert area or retaining wall, the committee should say how the edge of the penalty area is defined. And then when the edge of a body of water is not defined by the committee, the edge of the penalty area is defined by its natural boundaries. That is where the ground slopes down to form a depression that can hold the water. Um, and then if any open water course usually does not contain water, such as a drainage ditch or runoff area that is dry, except during any uh, a rainy season, the committee may define the, that area as part of the general area, which means it is not a penalty area. And then we have another video here from Jay. Here's a golf rule you should know. So here's the hole I'm playing. We've got a penalty area a little short of the green, and here's my ball sitting right on the line of the penalty area. So when is a ball considered in the penalty area? So the hole is that way, penalty area is on this side, general area is on this side. The line's a little faded, so it might be hard to see, but this is what the line looks like. Penalty areas can be marked by stakes, lines, or physical features like a retaining wall that the committee will define. Most of the time we're dealing with lines and stakes. When there is a line, the line always defines the penalty area. And the stake, if there is one, is just there to let you know from a long distance away that there is a penalty area here. But when it comes to the line, we actually want to look at the outer core side edge of that line. If any part of your ball is on the penalty area side, the ball is considered inside the penalty area. So in this case, there's just a little bit of my ball on the penalty area side, so this ball is in the penalty area. All right, and then your options for if your ball is in the penalty area, so reef, relief from ball not found, but in the penalty area. If a player's ball has not been found and is known or virtual, virtually certain that the ball came to rest in the penalty area, the player may take penalty relief under rule 17.1D or 17.2. Once the player puts another ball in play, the original ball is no longer in play and must not be played. And then we will get into our relief options here. So your first option is stroke and distance relief. The player may play from where the previous stroke was made. Then you have your back on the line relief, which is the player may drop in a relief area that is based on a reference line going straight back from the hole through the estimated point where the original ball last crossed the edge of the penalty area. So your reference point is the point on the course chosen by the player that is on the reference line and is further from the hole than the estimated point. Your relief area is one club length, no nearer the hole than the reference point in any area of the course, uh, except same penalty area that that ball already landed in. So those are your two options for a yellow penalty area. Um, and then we have your third option for red penalty areas only. Um, and that is your lateral relief area or your two club lengths. 
So your reference point is still the estimated point where the original ball last crossed the edge of the, penalty, the red penalty area. The relief area is two club lengths, not near the hole or not near the reference point. Um, and then it is also on any area of the course except that penalty area that the ball already came to rest in. And then do we have any questions? All right, keep it moving. So next we'll talk about the ball played from penalty area comes to rest in the same or another penalty area. So you still have your normal relief options, a stroke and distance back in the line and lateral relief if it is a red penalty area. Um, and then is the estimated point is where the original ball last crossed the edge of the penalty area. You also get a extra relief option in this situation where the player may play a ball from where he or she made the last stroke from outside of the penalty area. Um, so this picture here shows that that first shot was from the teen area. You are allowed to go back and play from that teen area as well. And then we got, if a player takes stroke and distance relief by dropping a ball in the penalty area um, and then decides not to play the drop ball from where that came to rest, the player may take further relief outside the penalty area under rule 17.1 D two or three uh, for red penalty area or under 17.2 A two. And then if the player does so, he or she gets one more additional penalty stroke for a total of two penalty strokes, one stroke for taking stroke and distance relief and one stroke for taking relief outside the penalty area. And just a note, the player may dire uh, directly take such relief outside the penalty area without first dropping the ball in the penalty area, but still gets those two penalty strokes if they choose to do that. Next, we got no relief under other rules. So when a player's ball is in a penalty area, there is no relief from interference by an abnormal course condition. They don't get embedded ball relief and they are not allowed to do any unplayable ball relief as well. And then do we have any questions about that? All right. Hey, Tom. Yep. Hey, I just wanted to um, chime in really quick. This is uh, <laughs> Jay Roberts. Um, Appreciate uh, you guys sharing some of these videos. I uh, hope they helped out. Um, but just wanted to offer a quick point of clarification. Um, on a previous video, I've, I've been tuned in. I've just been now able to sort of chime in. But uh, thanks to whoever asked the question about um, the requirement to mark the reference point when the ball was on that movable obstruction, um, the rake. Uh, I did say I must mark the reference point, but I should have said I should. There is no requirement. Uh, but it is obviously good practice. Um, so thanks to whoever asked that question. And as far as the penalty area video goes and when it's in the penalty area. Um, so the way that I explained it, I said that if any part of the ball is over that course side edge of the penalty area, um, then the ball would be in the penalty area. Now, it, that's technically still accurate, but the reason why I chose that verbiage was because it also captures the other potential scenario of a ball being suspended in the air. So say a ball is stuck in a bush off the ground, but it's still right there um, on that penalty area line. And you're trying to make that determination. When the ball is in the air like that, I think we want to look at um, if any part of that ball is over the course side edge of the line. But if the, if the ball is on the ground, I think at that point, we're just looking to see if any part of that ball is touching the course side edge of that penalty area line. If it is, then it would be considered in the penalty area, uh, but just wanted to offer that that quick clarification there on that video, but thank you guys for sharing the videos. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jay. Um, so we're going to move on here to stroke and distance ball loss or out of bounds and provisional ball. So we'll start with the definition of loss and out of bounds. We'll talk about relief under penalty of stroke and distance allowed at any time. And then we'll talk about ball loss or out of bounds stroke and distance relief must be taken and then provisional balls as well. So definition for lost, the player or the cat or the player's partner or player's caddy has three minutes to search for a ball. And then if the search begins and is then temporarily interrupted for a good reason, 
the time between the inter interruption and when the search resumes does not count as the part of those three minutes. So definition of out of bounds, any areas outside the boundary edge of the course as defined by the committee, uh, and then all areas inside the edge of that line are considered in bounds. And then the boundary edge of the course extends both up above the ground and down below the ground as well. And then when defined by stakes or a fence, the boundary edge is defined by the line between the course side points of the stakes or fence posts at ground level. And those stakes or fence posts are out of bounds. And then when defined by a painted line on the ground, the boundary edge is the course side edge of the line and the line itself is out of bounds. So relief under the penalty of stroke and distance is allowed at any time. So at any time, a player may take stroke and distance relief by adding one penalty stroke and playing the original ball or another ball from the previous point where the last stroke was made. And then a lost ball, if a ball is found within three minutes, but it is uncertain whether it is the player's ball. The player must promptly attempt to identify the ball. Um, you can see more of that in rule 7.2. And then is also allowed a reasonable time to do so, even if it happens after the three minutes uh, time has ended for that search. And then a ball out of bounds, a ball at rest is out of bounds only when all of the outside, only when all of it is outside the boundary edge of the course. And then if a ball is lost or out of bounds, the player must take stroke and distance relief. And the exception here is a player may substitute another ball under other rule when is known, excuse me, when is known or virtually certain what happened to the ball. An example is if it came to rest in a penalty area or moved by an outside influence. Any questions? So we'll move on to provisional balls. So when a provisional ball is allowed, if a ball may be lost outside a penalty area or be out of bounds, to save time, the player may play another ball provisionally under penalty of stroke and distance. The player must announce he or she is going to play a provisional ball. The player must use the word provisional or clearly indicate that he or she is playing a provisional ball under rule 18.3. And then when playing a provisional ball until it becomes the ball in play or is abandoned, uh, playing a provisional ball more than once. So player may continue to play provisional ball so long as it is played from a spot the same distance or further from the hole than where the original ball is estimated to be. And then when the provisional ball becomes the ball in play, when the original ball is lost anywhere on the course except in a penalty area um, or is out of bounds. And then when a provisional ball is played from a spot nearer the hole than the original ball is estimated to be. And then do we have any questions about provisional balls? Right. Then next we'll move into an unplayable ball. Uh, so the things we'll cover in this are the player may decide to take unplayable ball relief anywhere except the penalty area. The release op relief options for unplayable ball in the general area or on the putting green and then relief options for unplayable ball in a bunker. So we'll start with the player is the only person who may decide to treat his or her ball as playable. An unplayable ball relief is allowed anywhere on the course except in a penalty area. And then relief options for a ball in the general area or putting green when you're taking unplayable relief, you have stroke and distance, um, which the player may play from the previous was made. You get back on the line relief. The player may drop on the relief area that is based on the reference line going straight back from the hole through the spot that the original ball is at rest. 
And then the reference point is the point on the course chosen by the player that is on the reference line and is further from the hole than the spot of the original ball. And then your relief area is one club length, not near the hole than the reference point and in any area of the course. And then lastly, you have your lateral relief, which is your two club lengths. So your reference point for this is the spot of the original ball. So in the picture here, you have that ball in the bush. Where that ball is at rest in that bush is your re uh, reference point. And then you get two club lengths from that point, not near the hole, uh, not near the hole in the reference point and in any area of the course. And then next we'll talk about relief for unplayable ball on a bunker. So you have the same relief options, those three options as uh, we said in rule 16.2, except if player takes back on the line relief or lateral relief, the ball must be dropped in and come to rest in the relief area in the bunker. And that is options two and three. So if you're taking two or three, the ball must be dropped and come to rest in the bunker. Then you have one extra relief option for uh, an unplayable ball in the bunker, and that is number four there in the picture. Um, and then for a total of two penalty strokes, the player may take back on the line relief outside the bunker. Um, and then do we have any questions about unplayable uh, balls, any final questions? Wolf, I don't know if you have any closing remarks from today. Uh, we just had one question come in about um, the ball came to rest out of bounds and then eventually you know, rolled back inbounds. Um, we would play that ball from where it came to rest. So in that case, I, I put in the caveat that uh, you can't just wait there forever until the ball rolls back inbounds. But yeah, given... Given all that, um, you the ball would be back inbounds, and then a follow up um, that if your ball comes to rest out of bounds and uh, a helpful fan or parent uh, tosses the ball back inbounds, um, like Rusty said, that it's under nine point six. Um, you would need to move the ball back to its original spot. So in this case, it would be out of bounds. I think that happened at a the LPGA Q School Was that a couple of years ago. Um, any other last questions? I don't have anything um, anything specific. I will, like I said, I'll send you a follow-up email um, this afternoon uh, with the rules videos links um, and the Facebook page link. Um, and then the email I sent everyone yesterday had tomorrow's Zoom information in it, but I'll, I'll include that as well um, for tomorrow. Um, so same time tomorrow, um, again, Really appreciate all of the, the time and effort you put in throughout the year and, uh, and the time that you're, you're giving us this week. Um, hope you learn a lot, or if you, I know a lot of people here already know, already know everything. Uh, hope you, uh, hope everything's being reinforced. Um, but if we don't have any other questions, we'll wrap it up on that. Chris, um, this is, Chris, this is Bubba. Um, are we about the same time frame tomorrow? We end up about the same time. Uh, tomorrow should go a little bit faster. Yeah, I apologize. We we moved slower than than expected, but yeah, should oh, be about the same nine fine. to nine to eleven thirty. I'd say tomorrow. Okay, Chris. Thank Chris, you, Chris. This is Patrick Byler. Is the latest version of the official guide the the nineteen two thousand nineteen, or is there a newer one than that? Uh, I do not think they, they have not updated that since. Okay. Am I correct on that? Correct. Yeah, yeah they won't update update until yeah. next year. Yeah, okay. next year we'll get we'll get a new uh, version of that. But yeah, 2019 is still the, the last Thank one. You. Hey, Chris, real quick, Bill Hagel. Uh, just uh, Jay's videos were really good. I like them. Uh, where do I find them? What's his last name? Jay Roberts. I'll, I'll put a link to his YouTube homepage as well in that video. All right, great. Or, sorry, great. in that email. Chris, Chris, regarding the interpretations update, just go to the uh, website and it has that list of all the uh, all the updates. And just stick that in the book. Thank you. Yeah, good point, Barry. All right, thank you again to everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.